Hi, my name is Hugo, and this is the eighth episode in my series on classical China. This is the first of two episodes dealing with the Emperor Wei Di. This episode deals with his foreign policy. In its first 62 years, the Han Dynasty had mostly been preoccupied with fighting against internal enemies, such as rebellious vassal kings or rival families, with doing what it could to protect China from incursions by the Xiongnu, and with rebuilding the country after the devastating years of war that had accompanied the fall of the Qin Dynasty. By the time Wu Di ascended to the throne, though, this process of consolidation had been accomplished, and China found itself wealthier, more secure than it had been in a long time. There's a famous passage by Sima Qian in the records, which describes the happy economic situation of the empire at this time. Quote, By the time the present emperor had been on the throne for a few years, a period of over 70 years had passed since the founding of the Han. During that time, the nation had met with no major disturbances, so that, except in times of flood or drought, every person was well supplied and every family had enough to get along. The granaries in the cities and the countryside were full, and the government treasuries were running over with wealth. In the capital, the strings of cash had been stacked up by the hundreds of millions, until the cords that bound them had rotted away and they could no longer be counted. In the central granary of the government, new grain was heaped on top of the old until the building was full and the grain overflowed and piled up outside, where it spoiled and became unfit to eat. Horses were to be seen even in the streets and lanes of the common people, or plodding in great numbers along the paths between the fields and anyone so poor, so as to have to ride a mare, was disdained by his neighbours and not allowed to join gatherings of the villagers. Even the keepers of the community gates ate fine grain and meat. The local officials remained at the same posts long enough to see their sons and grandsons grow to manhood, and the higher officials occupied the same positions so long that they adopted the official titles as surnames. As a result, men had a sense of self-respect, and regarded it as a serious matter to break the law. Their first concern was to act in accordance with what was right, and to avoid shame and dishonour. It reminds me of Gibbon's opening paragraph to the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, where he talks about the fairest part of the earth and the most civilised portion of mankind. It was from this bedrock of wealth and security that the dramatic changes of Woody's reign were enacted. This episode, we're going to talk about the shift from a defensive foreign policy to an aggressive one. Not since the days of Qin Shi Huang had China embarked on expansionist campaigns. Under Wu Di, not only would it reclaim territories that had been lost during the collapse of Qin, but it would extend China's influence further than it had ever gone before, even reaching previously unknown lands and people. The main target of hand expansion was the Xiongnu Confederacy. Throughout Wu Di's reign, a total of 16 campaigns were launched into Xiongnu territory, as well as several more launched northwest as the struggle between the two powers touched the city-states and nomads of Central Asia, in the region that makes up the western reaches of modern-day China, and even as far west as modern Uzbekistan. After the Battle of Pingcheng in 200 BC, the Xiongnu and the Chinese had maintained the Heiqin relationship, whereby the Han sent the Xiongnu gifts and princesses in exchange for a promise not to invade. However, as we've seen, Xiongnu raids were a feature of every emperor's reign since the days of Gaudi. There are several explanations for why the Heiqin system developed after the Battle of Pingcheng failed to achieve peace. For one part, the Chinese had a poor understanding of Xiongnu culture and overestimated their ability to influence the nomads with diplomatic techniques that may have worked against other Chinese states. Most notably, as historian Jun Shu Zhang points out, the idea that marrying Han princesses to the Shan Yu would be an effective way to cultivate loyalty from the Xiongnu to China was based on a Chinese norm that the Xiongnu did not share, that a son-in-law should be obedient to his father-in-law. There are other reasons on the Xiongnu side of things that also explain why raids persisted, despite the pretense of a peaceful relationship. As historian Mark Edward Lewis explains, the Shan Yu was less secure in his position than the Huangdi was in his, his control over subordinate chiefs was much looser, and his legitimacy depended on his ability to be victorious in battle and in distributing the spoils of war. 
Thus, he was not in a strong position to prevent subordinates from making their own raids on China, and he himself could not take a pacifist stance in the long term. And what's more, since the founding of the Confederacy, the Xiongnu had been in a position of strength. Why should they respect a peace treaty with a country who, so far, had barely presented a military threat? So far, until now. Previous rulers had been hampered by the cost of such campaigns and the instability of China itself. For one example, if you remember in 177 BC, Wen Di had wanted to pursue a retreating Xiongnu army, but had been distracted by the rebellion of the King of Jubei. But now China was economically and politically secure enough for Wu Di to bring the fight to the Xiongnu. However, having the resources to fund these expeditions was just one part of the puzzle. The Han army itself underwent important transformations so that it could effectively fight the feared horse archers of the steppe. In the first episode of Qin, we talked about how, over the course of the spring and autumn and warring states periods, the aristocratic, chariot-based armies of the feudal age were gradually outmoded by armies composed of massive numbers of conscript infantry. Now these mass infantry-based armies were being outmoded as well. After the unsuccessful revolt of the Seven Kingdoms, large-scale fighting with Chinese opponents didn't look like it was going to be a major activity of the Han army. It was free to change into something that was built for expeditions into the steppe. Creating an army that could fight the Xiongnu was not so much a question of numbers as of skill. The Xiongnu's greatest advantage over the Chinese was in tactical ability and strategic mobility. Like practically all great nomadic empires of history, virtually every man of the Xiongnu could ride a horse and shoot a bow with an ability that only the best Chinese soldiers could match. They were literally able to run circles around much larger armies of Chinese infantry. At the same time, an army that was virtually entirely mounted could easily evade one that was moving at marching pace. The hand needed to start closing the skill and cavalry gap if they were going to make any headway. Measures had been taken to transform the army prior to the reign of Wu Di, many of which were the brain children of Chao Tsuo the man who had been Jingdi's imperial counsellor before his unfortunate execution during the revolt of the Seven Kingdoms. Chao saw that the Chinese needed to transition to a cavalry-dominated army if they were to match the Xiongnu's mobility in the vastness of the steppe. However, horse breeding was not yet a big business in China, so he recommended policies to encourage it. During the reign of Wen Di, in 169 BC, he proposed a policy whereby if a family donated a horse to the government, three of its men would be exempted from military service. During the reign of Jingdi, the government set aside massive pastures for horse breeding and put 30,000 slaves to work on them. By the start of Wu Di's reign, these pastures had produced 450,000 horses. The Xiongnu could see what the Han were up to, and several of the raids in Jingdi's reign specifically targeted these government pastures. Having horses was all well and good, but for military purposes, you also needed riders. But equestrian skills were a rarity in Han China. It was difficult to train sufficiently peasant conscripts in the art of horsemanship or the use of a crossbow, seeing as they were only required to serve for one year at a time. How could such soldiers match Xiongnu riders who had spent their entire lifetimes in the saddle and shooting bows? The solution was to transition to a professional army, comprised of men for whom soldiering was a career, not a one-off obligation. In Wu Di's reign, the peasant conscript began to be phased out in preference of the full-time soldier. The military service that commoners were required to provide was in some cases commuted by a tax to pay the salaries of professionals. The majority of these professionals were simply men paid to be soldiers, equipped with government horses and weapons. In a move hearkening back to the days of Qin, Wu Di also used convicts as soldiers. Unlike peasant conscripts, convicts could be obliged to work for the government for several years, meaning there was enough time to properly train them. There were also cases of employing surrendered barbarians. However, they mainly served in the army's station to defend the capital, rather than in the expeditionary armies that Wu Di would send into the steppe, probably for fear that they would desert and join their kindred Xiongnu instead. Nevertheless, some barbarians, including Xiongnu, played a role in these campaigns, as scouts familiar with the land, and even as commanders. A military education curriculum was set for officers, incorporating classic books such as Sun Tzu's Art of War, as well as works by generals who had served in Wu Di's campaigns. The corpus of military law was also standardised. 
Such measures really helped to develop military men as a distinct class during Wu Di's reign. In the campaigns of Wu Di, the typical horseman was armed with a light crossbow, long and short lances, a sword, a knife, as well as a shield and light armour. Because of the horse breeding project, the army could field a much larger number of cavalry than previous Chinese armies, roughly 40% of total armed forces, according to historian Jun Shu Zhang. Armies assembled for expeditionary campaigns were often composed almost totally of cavalry. Even if an army was entirely mounted, though, they still weren't as mobile as the Xiongnu. The Xiongnu had herd animals, which they could take with them, and were used to hunting. The Chinese, in contrast, were unused to living off the land, and brought huge quantities of grain with them, slowing things down. Sometimes this grain was carried by a train of oxen, meaning that the main body of the army still had to travel at basically walking pace. The problem of food put a severe limitation on how long a campaign could feasibly be maintained. None of Wu Di's military expeditions lasted more than 100 days. Anyway, now that we're familiar with the context of these campaigns, we're just about ready to get into the story of Wu Di's war with the Xiongnu. But before we do, I just need to quickly mention how the dating of Wu Di's reign works. So far, we've mostly been dealing with regnal years, where the years were counted according to how long the current emperor had been on the throne. Wendy had complicated things a bit by beginning to count again halfway through his reign, so that we had a former and a latter period. Jingde recounted twice, so that there were a former, a middle, and latter periods. Under Wu Di, a new system was implemented. He introduced the idea of organising years into eras, which were usually four or six years long. They were usually named after some auspicious event, or after a particular virtue the government was promoting. In the next episode, we'll talk a bit more about why this new system was adopted. So that any given year would be called something like the second year of the era Yuan Shua, which is roughly 127 BC. There was a total of 11 eras in Wu Di's reign, Without knowing which order the year has happened in, the era names aren't really going to be very helpful to, for you in mentally placing events. So, I'm a sad to announce that I'll mostly be leaving the traditional dates behind, and instead I'll just use Gregorian years. When Wu Di ascended the throne, relations with the Xiongnu were actually in a relatively positive spot. The Heichen peace was affirmed, trade was allowed on the border, and the hand court sent them gifts. In 135 BC, Wu Di's sixth year on the throne, Envoys from the Xiongnu came to the Han court, asking to reaffirm the peace alliance. The emperor brought the matter to court for consideration, as was the standard practice. There were some outspoken men who thought reaffirming the alliance was a bad idea, and Wu Di himself was probably reluctant to agree to it. The superintendent of state visits, Wang Hui, had previously served as an official in provinces bordering the Xiongnu, and didn't trust them. He warned, quote, Although the hand concludes treaties with the Xiongnu, it is never more than a couple of years before they violate the agreement. It would be better to refuse their offer and send troops to attack them. However, more senior ministers were against the idea of war and thought it best to continue the peace agreement. The imperial councillor, Han Anguo, reminded the court of the traditional difficulties of fighting the Xiongnu, of fighting campaigns far away from home and pointed out there was little profit to be had in conquering the rough land where the Xiongnu lived. The senior ministers won out the day. Even if Wu Di had wanted to attack the Xiongnu, he was still young, an early teenager, and he didn't yet have the confidence to challenge the adults around him. However, the next year, 134, Wu Di was able to initiate a plot which aimed to capture the Shan Yu, Jun Chen, grandson of the great founder of the confederacy, Mao Dun. A man called Nye Wang Yi, from the city Ma Yi in the northern Yan Man Commandery, suggested the idea to the emperor. He believed that due to the recent friendly relations, the Shan Yu could be lured into a trap. Nye entered the territory of the Xiongnu, pretending to be a refugee. Somehow, he was able to meet the Shan Yu, and he told Jun Chen that he could murder the governor of Ma Yi and his officials, so that the Xiongnu could sweep in and plunder the city. The Shan Yu was greatly excited by the idea, and sent Nye off back to Ma Yi. However, when Nye returned to his home city, instead of murdering the officials, they executed some criminals and hung their heads on the city wall to trick the Xiongnu scouts into thinking the coup had been successful. Meanwhile, the Han had arranged for an army of 300,000 infantry, cavalry and crossbowmen to conceal themselves in the valley around Ma Yi. 
The army was led by the imperial councillor Han Ang Guo, with some subordinate generals including Li Guang, Gong Sun He, and Wang Hui, the same man who had been against reaffirming the peace treaty. Wang Hui was in fact the man who had devised the military aspect of the plot. The plan was that once Jun Chen entered Ma Yi, the main section of the Chinese force would attack the city, while sections led by some of the subordinate generals would attack the baggage trains following the Shan Yu. The people who lived around Ma Yi, aware of the impending carnage, all deserted their farms and went somewhere else. When Jun Chen, with an army of 100,000, crossed the border, he set course for Ma Yi, which was less than 50 kilometres away. As they travelled, they saw farms and livestock, but no people. Suspicious, Jun Chen sent some men to investigate one of the warning beacon stations that dotted the frontier. There, they captured a defence official, who revealed the whole plot to them. Jun Chen exclaimed, quote, Heaven was on my side when I captured this official, and he named the man Heavenly King. He turned the army around, and they escaped back into their own territory. The forces under Han Ang Guo attempted a pursuit, but they were not equipped to go beyond the border, and gave up once they reached it. Wang Hui, once he had learned that the Shan Yu was not going to enter Ma Yi, decided to retreat rather than attack the baggage train as had been the plan, as he knew that his relatively small detachment was no match for Jun Chen's best troops. As the architect of the plan, he expected to be executed for its failure, so he tried to bribe the Chancellor Tian Fen into putting in a good word for him. Tian put the matter to Wu Di's mother, Empress Dowager Wang, and the next time the Emperor came to visit her, she tried to persuade him to let Wang Hui off. But the teenage Emperor was insistent that Wang Hui must be executed, as an apology to the Empire for the failure of the plot. When he heard that he was doomed, Wang Hui committed suicide. After the Ma Yi plot, relations between the Han and the Xiongnu soured, as you might expect. The Xiongnu began raiding the border again. However, trade was allowed to continue, because the Han thought that it weakened the Xiongnu. Since the Xiongnu mostly bought luxury items from China, the Han imagined that they were either trading the essential for the inessential, or that the influence of China's elegant culture would sap their martial spirit. In the spring of 129, the first outright attack on Xiongnu territory was launched. Four generals led separate armies in, atta- in an attack on the border markets. They marched from different places and on different targets, which was a strategy designed to negate the Xiongnu's advantage in mobility. The nomads would not be able to make their usual huge circling manoeuvres around one army without running into another army marching in parallel. The strategy was employed in most of the subsequent campaigns as well, with different armies marching out from commanderies all along the border. However, the results of the first campaign were not that good for the Chinese. One of the generals, Gong Sunao, lost 7,000 men out of an army of 10,000. Li Guang, who participated in the Ma Yi plot, was also defeated and was captured by the Xiongnu. Now, this Li Guang was a strong warrior on a physical level. Tall and long-armed, he was a practiced archer and spent much of his life on the frontier. When he wasn't soldiering, he passed his time by hunting tigers, which proud the wilderness and troubled those who had to work outside the safety of their local village. One time when he was out hunting, Li caught sight of a rock in the grass which he mistook for a tiger, and he instinctively shot it. When he went to investigate, he found that his arrow had penetrated the stone. Another hobby of his was playing archery drinking games with his friends. By the time Wu Di's campaigns had started, he was already a veteran soldier. He had served as a horse archer in Wendy's reign, and he had fought against the Xiongnu in the raid of 166, when they nearly reached Chang'an, and in that campaign had killed and captured several Xiongnu riders himself. As a reward for his deeds, he was made a palace attendant, and accompanied Wendy on hunting trips. During the reign of Jingdi, he had served during the Revolt of the Seven Kingdoms, and then had a stint working as a governor for several border commanderies, where his skills and knowledge were put to use training the local garrisons and fighting off Xiongnu raids. He developed a reputation as a soldier's general. Whenever he received rewards, he divided them amongst his men, and when out on an expedition, he was happy to eat the same food as the common soldiers. Though he had enjoyed a good salary for a number of years, by the end of his life he left no money behind, having spent it all on others. Sima Chen says that he was, quote, a clumsy speaker and never had much to say. He would explain battle tactics by drawing diagrams on the ground. Basically, he was the sort of man who took simple pleasure from life in the army. 
However, the relatively peaceful reigns of Wendy and Jingdi meant that his talents as a soldier weren't enough to give his career a rocket jump. Wendy had said to him once when he was a palace attendant, quote, What a pity you were not born at a better time. Had you lived in the age of Emperor Gaozu, you would have had no trouble at winning a marquisate of at least 10,000 households. Well, with Emperor Wu's new expansionist policy, the time had come where Li Guang might be able to put his talents to use and receive the sort of reward he deserved. A man who hunted tigers in his spare time wasn't going to let something like being taken prisoner of war cut his career short before it could fully blossom. Li Guang's fearsome reputation had reached the ears of the Shan Yu, who had ordered that if the man was captured, he was to be brought to the Xiongnu court. After defeating his army, some Xiongnu riders found Li Guang alive but badly wounded, so they strung a stretcher between two spare horses and carried him between them. They had gone about five kilometres, and all the while Li stayed quiet, pretending to be dead. While he was lying there, jostled about as the horses trotted along with the group, he managed to take a sneaky gander at his surroundings. He was near the end of the group of riders, and nearby him was a young man, a boy even, with a bow slung over his shoulder and riding a fine horse. In an incredible feat of athleticism, Lee managed to jump out of his litter and onto the boy's horse. He grabbed the boy's bow and knocked him off with a solid punch, then turned the steed around and galloped south before he could be stopped. He went 10 or 15 kilometres, with several hundred of the enemy right on his tail. Lee, though, who was probably one of the best Chinese horse archers, was able to dispatch a few as he rode. Eventually, he ran into the remnants of his army and led them back to China. Now, I should say that the only source for this fabulous tale must have been Li Wang himself. However, for what it's worth, Sima Chen, who one time saw Li in person, described him as a man of integrity who was known for his simplicity and sincerity. Despite his bold escape, Li Guang was punished upon his return to the capital, along with the general who had lost 7,000 men, Gong Sunyao. Chinese military tradition expected the general of a defeated army to die with his men, rather than to be captured alive or escape. Both men were imprisoned, and the officials recommended that they be executed. However, Wu Di instead decided to punish them by demoting them to the rank of commoners. It must have been a bad blow for Li Guang, making it look like his career as a general was over. But there were many more campaigns ahead, and Wu Di couldn't afford to throw away experienced soldiers like Li Guang so easily. The only general of the 129 campaign who met with some success was Wei Qing. He managed to kill or capture 700 Xiongnu. Not a major victory in the grand scale of things, but the only thing preventing the campaign from being a total failure. Wei came from a bit of a rough childhood. He was the product of an illicit affair between a concubine of the Marquis of Pingyang and a petty clerk who worked for the Marquis. Initially, he lived with his father's legitimate family, but was treated badly by his half-brothers and stepmother. So he was moved to the household of his mother, where he grew up as a servant of the Marquis. He eventually achieved a somewhat respectable position within the hierarchy he inhabited, becoming a rider of the Marquis's household, and an attendant for one of the Marquis's daughters. He really rose to prominence when his sister by the same mother, Wei Jifu, was sent to the Imperial Palace and became a concubine of Wu Di in 139. Wei Qing went along with her and worked at one of the palaces. After narrowly avoiding death, due to some nasty harem intrigue, he was brought to the emperor's attention and was made palace counsellor. Then, in 129, he was lucky enough to be picked as a general, although his achieving this position was probably as much, if not more, due to luck rather than to merit. He ended up proving himself a worthy commander and became one of the greatest generals of the Wu Di era. He was described by Seema as, quote, a kindly retiring man who attempted to ingratiate himself with the emperor by being mild and compliant. This polite, reserved attitude was not in keeping with the confident, extravagant feeling of the times. Thus, despite his military success, he did not achieve the sort of celebrity and popularity that other generals did. The Xiongnu launched counterattacks the following winter, and they carried on till autumn. The commander at Yuyang in the northeast was most heavily hit. The defence of the province was commanded by Han Angua, the same man who had been general in chief of the Ma Yi plot. He was by this time no longer imperial counsellor, and in the winter years of his career. He dropped a ball a bit on the defence here. 
It seemed for a while that the Xiongnu raiding had come to an end, so he asked the emperor if he could disband the garrison so that the men could attend to the work of farming. These garrison soldiers would have been largely men fulfilling their compulsory military service, rather than professionals. However, when the men were allowed to go home, the Xiongnu resumed their attacks, and, with only 700 soldiers left under his command, Han Anguo was unable to challenge them, leaving them to ravish the commander his farmland. Angry with Han's failure, the emperor later removed him further east, to the commander of Yorbe Ping. Meanwhile, another attack was made against the Xiongnu, comprised of two armies, one of which was led by Wei Qing and consisted of 30,000 cavalry. He managed to kill or capture several thousand of the enemy. The other army didn't achieve much success, but neither did it suffer any terrible defeats. The year after, 127 BC, the Chinese achieved their first really important victory. In the spring, Wei Qing led an army northwest and managed to reclaim the Ordos. This is the area called the region south of the Yellow River by Sima Chen, and refers to the land which is encircled by the Great Bend the river goes around after it flows out of the mountains. The Ordos had been the northwestern extent of the Qin Empire, and had been lost to the nomads after the revolution. After Wei Qing's victory, two new commanderies were established in the conquered territory, and settlers were sent to colonise them. In the course of the campaign, Wei Qing's army killed 2,300 Xiongnu, and took a further 3,000 as prisoners, as well as capturing a million sheep, oxen and horses, all the while suffering very little casualties. The inclusion of the number of captured livestock might seem strange, but remember that the Xiongnu were pastoral nomads. In the same way that farming was the backbone of the Chinese economy, herd animals, raised for food, clothing and transport, were the backbone of theirs. Tribal warfare amongst nomadic people like the Xiongnu, often centred around the stealing of livestock, so, in a way, the Chinese were using a similar sort of strategy, scaled up immensely. As a reward for this tremendous success, Wei Qing was enfeoffed as Marquis of Pingling. Interestingly, though they had just won the Ordos territory, the Han conceded some small northern portions of the commandery Shanggu. The records doesn't explain why they did this, but it almost seems like it could have been rubbing the salt in the wound, making the acquisition of Ordos look all the more massive in comparison. The stress of these repeated attacks was perhaps having an effect on the Xiongnu's internal politics. In the winter of 126, Shan Yu Junchen died. However, rather than passing down to his named heir, his son Yu Dan, the throne was seized by his younger brother, Yi Zhi Xie. Yi Zhi Xie and his followers attacked and defeated Yu Dan and his, after which Yu Dan fled to China. The Han welcomed him. Part of their long term strategy was about encouraging Xiongnu leaders to defect and treating well those who surrendered was an important part of that strategy. They enfeoffed Yudan, making him Marquess of Xi'an, but he died a few months later for reasons that have been lost to history. The new Shan Yu made several attacks on Chinese territory, determined to show his strength, not just to the Chinese, but to the Xiongnu kings whose support he needed to gain. Thousands of Chinese were killed or abducted in these raids, and the Xiongnu even succeeded in killing Gong Yu, governor of the commandery Dai, the wise king of the right, the Xiongnu king who had been lord of the Ordos, led raids on that territory he had just lost. However, these attacks, bloody as they were, could not turn the tide against the Chinese. A few years later, in 124, Wei Qing led a force of 30,000 as part of the next expedition, marching out from the territory he had recently conquered. Other generals led armies from provinces further east on the frontier. Perhaps as a sign of the respect he had for Wei Qing, Huidi gave Gongsun Ao, the general who had lost 7,000 in the campaign of 129 and had been demoted to the rank of commoner, a command under Wei. Gongsun Ao was a personal friend of Wei's, and I wonder if Wei might have tugged at the emperor's sleeve a little to have his comrade reappointed. Wei's army targeted the lands of the wise king of the right, one of the highest men in the Xiongnu hierarchy. Unfortunately, we are not given any indication of where exactly the wise king was camped, and when Wei Qing attacked. However, we are told that the king did not expect the Chinese riders to be able to reach him and had gotten drunk and was enjoying himself, only to be alerted in the dark of night that a Chinese army had managed to sneak around and encircle his camp. Utterly shocked, the wise king panicked and quickly escaped through a gap in the Chinese line with just a few hundred of his best men, as well as his favourite concubine. Though they were not able to capture the king, 
Wei Qing and his army managed to take prisoner 10 petty chieftains, 15,000 men and women who were living at the camp, and hundreds of thousands of livestock. I should mention that there was a lot of value for the Chinese in taking prisoners alive rather than massacring them. These attacks on the Xiongnu saw soldiers marching further north than Chinese armies had ever gone before. They were going into uncharted territory, and prisoners could tell them vital information about the surrounding land. Wu Di increased Wei Qing's markers as a reward for his victory, and offered to enfief his sons as well. However, in a move that shows a good deal of respect for his military comrades, and must have made him pretty popular among them as well, Wei objected to the enfeifment of his own sons, who had not yet accomplished anything, and protested that his subordinate officers, who had been essential to his success, had been given nothing. He said, quote, Unworthy as I am, I have been granted the privilege of riding into battle. Through the divine wisdom of your majesty, the army has won a great victory, but the merit is due wholly to the fighting ability of my officers. Your majesty has graciously increased my own fief, but my sons are still in swaddling clothes and have performed no service. Though your majesty kindly wishes to set aside lands and enfeef them as well, I fear it would do little to encourage the men who have fought under me. How could I dare to accept fiefs for Kang and my other sons? Woody took the objection well, and enfeefed several of Wei's subordinates as Marquesas. He also named Wei General-in-Chief, giving him authority over all the other generals for future expeditions. Two campaigns were launched the next year, with Wei as the new General-in-Chief. On each occasion, Han sent an army of around 100,000. Both achieved pretty good results. In the first, over 3,000 Xiongnu were killed, and in the second, over 18,000 were killed or captured. However, the campaigns of 123 are mostly significant because of some changes in the Chinese officer corps. Li Guang, the aging soldier who had made that daring escape after being taken prisoner by the enemy in 129, was allowed to serve again, this time as general of the rear. The campaigns of 123 were also marked by the debut of, of Hua Chuming, Wei Qing's 17-year-old nephew. Hua was given the title of Swift Commander, and, even in this, his first year leading troops, he showed himself to be a brave and enthusiastic general. In the second campaign, in the summer, he took a force of just 800 riders and advanced far ahead of the main army. Even when he ran into a larger Xiongnu force, he was able to defeat them and killed or captured over 2,000. For this achievement, he was enfeefed as the Guanjun Marquis, Guanjun meaning highest in the army. Sima Qian says that Hua was, quote, a man of few words and was little given to idle talk, but he possessed great daring and initiative. He is portrayed as the typical young firebrand type. He rejected orthodox military thinking, such as the contents of the classics like the art of war and the Wu Zi, and claimed, quote, the only thing that matters is how one's own strategy is going to work. There is no need to study the old-fashioned rules of warfare. He was entirely focused on defeating the Xiongnu, and had little interest in living well in China while there were still campaigns to fight. Another noteworthy event of the 123 campaigns was the defeat of one of the Chinese generals. Zhao Xin, general of the vanguard, was in fact a former Xiongnu petty king, who had defected to the Han and had been enfeoffed as a marquis. In the campaign of summer 123, he was leading his army along a different route to the main force, and had the bad luck of running into the Shan Yu's own forces. His army was completely wiped out, but Zhao Xin himself surrendered to the Xiongnu, and was taken back under the Shan Yu's wing. Zhao Xin started advising the Shan Yu on points of strategy, and in particular made the suggestion that the Shan Yu make his camps further away from the Chinese border, and rather stay on the north side of the Gobi Desert which would force the Chinese armies to march further from home and overstretch their supply lines. The Shanyu agreed with the idea, and subsequent hand campaigns either had to attack the subordinate kings who still operated near the border, or, if they wanted to target the Shanyu himself, they would have to make the dangerous march across the desert. The Han first took the opportunity to attack those Xiongnu who remained near the border. Three separate campaigns were launched in 121 BC, and Wunderkind Huo Chubing showed his quality in astounding style. Now holding the title Swift Cavalry General, leading an army of over 10,000 in the spring, he advanced north and reached Mount Yanji, then marched another 400 kilometres or so further north in pursuit of the son of the Shan Yu. In the course of the campaign, he also forced the submission of several other tribal peoples who were not part of the Confederacy, and captured the son of the Xiongnu Hunye King. 
In total, over 8,000 people were killed or captured. The expedition also resulted in the capture of an artifact called the Golden Man, which was used by the Xiongnu Xiao Tu king for worship. Scholars have wondered if this Golden Man was in fact a statue of Buddha. If so, this would have marked China's first contact with the religion, roughly two and a half centuries before the first Buddhist missionaries from India found their way to China. In the summer, Kuo led an expedition to the Qilian Mountains, forcing the Xiongnu Xiao Tu King, who resided there, to surrender, along with his 2,500 men. In total, around 30,000 Xiongnu were killed or taken prisoner in the campaign, including several kings. In this campaign, Kuo again showed his enthusiastic approach. Sima Qian says, quote, The soldiers and horses under the command of the older generals were no match for the exploits of Hua Chubing. For one thing, Kuo Chubing always saw to it that he had a select group of soldiers, and in addition he was daring enough to penetrate deep into enemy territory, time and again riding off ahead of the main body of the army with the best cavalry. Moreover, his men seemed to enjoy the favour of heaven, for they never encountered any serious difficulties. The older generals, on the other hand, were constantly being tried for proceeding too slowly and failing to appear on time. The campaigns of 121 are also notable, because we are given a somewhat detailed description of a battle between the Chinese and the Xiongnu. The battle was fought by the army of Li Guang, when he was participating in the campaign that was attacking the more easterly end of the Xiongnu lands. I think Sima Chan was a bit of a fan of Li's, and his description is pretty tight, so I'll let him relay the events. Quote, Li Guang, as chief of palace attendants, was sent to lead a force of 4,000 cavalry north from Yorbei Ping. Zhang Qian, the Bo Wang Marquis, leading 10,000 cavalry, rode out with Li Guang, but took a somewhat different route. When Li Guang had advanced several hundred Li into enemy territory, a single Li is about 0.4 kilometers, the Xiongnu leader known as the Wise King of the Left appeared, with 40,000 cavalry, and surrounded Li Guang's army. His men were all terrified, but Li Guang ordered his son Li Gan to gallop out to meet the enemy. Li Gan, accompanied by only 20 or 30 riders, dashed straight through the Xiongnu horsemen, scattering them left and right, and then returned to his father's side, saying, These barbarians are easy enough to deal with. After this, Li Guang's men were somewhat reassured. Li Guang ordered his men to draw up in a circle, with their ranks facing outward. The enemy charged furiously down on them, and the arrows fell like rain. Over half the hand soldiers were killed, and their arrows were almost gone. Li Guang then ordered the men to load their bows and hold them in readiness, but not to discharge them, while he himself, with his huge yellow crossbow, shot at the sub-commander of the enemy force and killed several of the barbarians. After this, the enemy began to fall back a little. By this time, night had begun to fall. Every one of Li Guang's officers and men had turned white with fear, but Li Guang, as calm and confident as though nothing had happened, worked to get his ranks into better formation. After this, the men knew they could never match his bravery. The following day, Li Guang once more fought off the enemy, and in the meantime Zhang Chan at last arrived with his army. The Xiongnu forces withdrew, and the Han armies likewise retreated, being in no condition to pursue them. By this time, Li Guang's army had been practically wiped out. I've got to wonder if the scattering of the Xiongnu, when Li's son charged them, with a mere 20 or 30 riders, was in fact just an example of the skirmishing hit-and-run tactics that were the bread and butter of nomadic warfare. Elsewhere, Sima notes that the Xiongnu, quote, do not consider it a disgrace to run away. Anyway, Wu Di wasn't very happy with Li Guang's performance. Although he had emerged triumphant, or at least alive, after facing much larger force, he had lost most of his men. As a result, he was not rewarded. On the plus side, though, he wasn't punished either. Li was getting a bit fed up with his lack of progress. He had been fighting the Xiongnu all his life, but all around him, relative newcomers like Wei Qing, Huo Bing, and their officers were being made marquises. Meanwhile, Li received nothing, despite all his years of experience. Perhaps the most rankling thing was that his cousin, Li Tsai, who did not have many achievements to his name, and was known as a bit of a dunce, had been made Chancellor, the highest official in the land, and Li Guang was left disgruntled. Despairing, he turned to a diviner named Wang Shuo to see if there was any reason for his career stagnation. He asked, quote, 
Ever since the Han started attacking the Xiongnu, I have never failed to be in the fight. I have had men in my command who were company commanders, or even lower, who didn't even have the ability of average men, and yet 20 or 30 of them have won Marquisates on the strength of their achievements in attacking the barbarian armies. I have never been behind anyone else in doing my duty. Why is it I have never won an ounce of distinction, so that I could be in fief like the others? Is it that I just don't have the kind of face to become a Marquise, or is it all a matter of fate? The diviner asked Lee to reflect on his past, to see if there were any mistakes or instances of misconduct that could be holding him back. Lee recounted an incident from the reign of Jingdi, when he had been the governor of Long Si, one of the commanderies on the western border. To the west of China, on and around the Tibetan Plateau, there lived a people known to the Chinese as the Chiang. They were tribal, and their economy was a combination of wheat farming and herding sheep and other animals. Unlike the Xiongnu, they had, no, they had no overarching political structure unifying them all together, and in fact stayed in a sort of equilibrium where they avoided forming groups that were too large. A paragraph from the Book of Later Han, the standard history written by 5th century scholar Fan Ye, provides the classic description, quote, As a people, they never established a lord-vassal relationship, nor developed a system of control and solidarity amongst themselves. When a group grew in population and strength to a certain point, they would split into several tribes, each under the leadership of a powerful chieftain, but when a group declined, they would attach themselves to a powerful tribe as followers. Anyway, so some of these tribes, who were either living in or next to the Long Sea Commandery, had an uprising of some sort. As governor, Li Guang managed to persuade 800 of them to surrender, but when they were under his power, he had them all executed. Li told the diviner, that he had regretted the decision ever since. It was considered highly immoral to execute those who had surrendered. The diviner said that this incident was the reason that Lee would never become a Marquise. It's unclear what exactly he meant by this. Was it just that Woody would not want to enfeef someone who had such a black mark on their career? Or was he thinking about some higher cosmic justice? Either way, Lee must have been crushed to hear that it would never happen to him. However, he was determined to keep fighting until he was physically unable, and this will not be the last we see of him. The greatest effect of the 121 campaigns was the defection of some significant Xiongnu kings to the Han, which basically diffused the western portion of the border with the Xiongnu. The Shan Yu was very disappointed in the Hunye and Xiao Tu kings, who had been the main victims of Huo Chubing's campaigns. In the autumn, he summoned them to his court with the intent to execute them, Terrified, the two kings decided to surrender to the Han. On the way, though, the Hunye king assassinated the Xiao Tu king and took command of his forces. He came to China with about 40,000 men. Hua Chubing was sent to accept the surrender, and met them just before they crossed the Yellow River and entered the Ordos. Some of the Hunye's king's subordinate generals, when they saw Hua's army, decided that they would rather not surrender to the Han and move to desert. As you might expect, Hua was having none of this, and he led his riders at a charge into the Xiongnu midst, and killed 8,000 who were attempting to flee. He then arranged for the Hunye king to be sent ahead of his men in a special carriage to Chang'an to meet the emperor. It was quite a brutal show of force. Hua had quickly and effectively separated the men from their leader, and shown them the power of their new master. The Hunye king and some of his subordinates were richly rewarded. They were made marquises, and given gifts totaling, totaling a worth of 10 million cash. The body of a surrendered Xiongnu was settled in the northwesterly commanderies, where they were allowed to continue their native practices and were treated as a subject nation. A new unit of administration was created for them, known as a dependent state. These lay within the territory of a commandery, but their administration existed separately to that of the commandery. They were appointed a Chinese commandant who mainly had a supervisory role. The inhabitants of dependent states were not expected to pay the usual taxes and such, of an ordinary Han subject. The dependent states became a key administrative tool that the Han used to settle barbarian peoples. In summer 119, the Han mounted the largest campaign yet. Wei Qing and Huo Chubing each led a force of 50,000 cavalry. This time, their cavalry was also supported by infantry, each general commanding a further 50 or so thousand. Many of the men were volunteers, who used their own horses, in addition to the professional soldiers using the state-owned ones. There were also tens of thousands of people working on each army's supply chain, 
and another 140,000 horses, carrying all the army's food. The horses were fattened up before they set out, so that they would have more fuel to burn. The reason for this massive amount of preparation was the ambition of their objective. The armies were going to cross the Gobi Desert and capture the Shan Yu himself, who was camped on its northern edge. Even to attempt this feat was something unprecedented in Chinese history. Today, the Gobi is roughly 800 kilometers wide, north-south. The climate is generally cool, even in summer, though the temperature can change rapidly and even reach the high 30s in Celsius degrees. It gets very dry and offers little in the way of foraging. The sorts of terrain that the armies were to march through included sand, clay, salt lakes, with very few fresh water sources. It's mostly flat, and in some places, you could see nothing but yellow sand in every direction. Wei Qing and his army set out from the commandery Ding Xiang, which was in the centre of the border, while Huo Shubing led his from the commandery's Dai and Yorbei Ping, a little further to the east. Originally Huo was to march out from Ding Xiang, but it was reported that the Shan Yu was camped more to the east. By this time Huo was Wu Di's favourite general, and the emperor wanted to make sure that his finest would be the one to first encounter the Shan Yu's men. Huo's army was, to, was given the best soldiers, including barbarian riders who had surrendered in previous campaigns, who formed Huo's personal guard. Moreover, none of the officers serving Huo were ranked as generals, instead being division commanders. This meant that Huo had total authority over all his forces. Wei Qing, on the other hand, was chief among a host of subordinate generals, who were a bit more willing to argue with Wei, which caused them some difficulty. The two armies would cross the desert separately, and reunite on the other side. When the Shan Yu's court heard about the oncoming armies, Xiao Xin, the general who had surrendered to the Xiong Nu, advised the Shan Yu to wait at the edge of the desert, so that he would be ready to attack the Chinese while they were still recovering from their brutal march. Accordingly, the Shan Yu sent his supply trains further north, and camped at the edge of the desert with his best men. We're told that both generals marched more than a thousand li across the desert, which suggests a journey of several weeks. Huo Chubing, eager as ever, seems to have left the slower elements of his army behind, and advanced ahead with his 50,000 cavalry. He had his men packed lightly, and they dashed across the desert. When he reached the other side, he could not find the Shan Yu. Instead, he ran into the forces of the local Xiongnu leader, the wise king of the left. There, he again had a great victory, apparently capturing 70,000 of the enemy. He pushed on even further into the land north of the desert, living off the enemy's supplies. He even performed the Feng and Shan sacrifices at the Langju Su and Gu Yan mountains. This seems to have been a particularly bold move, and unfortunately there's not much explanation for why he did it in the records, and nor have I found much scholarly speculation on the matter. These sacrifices had not been performed since Qin Shi Huang, had done them to mark his achievement in uniting China, and they were considered something exceptional, something that could only be done by an emperor who was extremely confident in his sovereignty. Perhaps Hua meant to show, by performing them in this remote area, how far the emperor's realm extended. However, it seems awfully presumptuous of him to have done it, if he was acting on his own accord. On the other hand, maybe he had received instructions from Wu Di to perform them. A few years later, Wu Di himself performed the Feng and Shan at Mount Tai, where the first emperor had done them. That's something we'll talk about in, in the next episode, though. For now, we'll turn to how Wei Qing's army fared. Though he was more reserved than his nephew, Wei Qing was just as keen to defeat the Shan Yu. He set out across the Gobi with all his infantry and baggage in tow. Our old friend, Li Guang, was at the front of the march, serving as general of the vanguard. Poor Li had nearly missed out on participating in the campaign, since the emperor was worried about his old age and he had only received the position after begging that he be allowed to go. Now here he was, at the front of the army, first in line to meet whatever was waiting for them at the edge of the desert. However, on their way across, they captured a Xiongnu scout, and found out from him the location of the Shan Yu's camp. Wei Qing equipped his best men with a couple of armoured carriages, and decided to push ahead of the main army and catch the Shan Yu. He ordered Li to take his men and join up with the general of the right, Zhao Yiji, march along the longer eastern route, and reunite with Wei's forces once they got out of the desert. But Li begged for Wei not to send him on this side road. He said, quote, I've been appointed as general of the vanguard, and yet now you have shifted my position and ordered me to go round by the east. I've been fighting the Xiongnu ever since I was old enough to wear my hair bound up, 
and now I would like to have just one chance to get at the Shan Yu. I beg you to let me stay in the vanguard and advance and fight to the death with him. However, Wei would not change his mind. Wu Di had warned him all about the bad luck Li Guang had run into in the course of his career, and didn't want Li to be the one to attack the Shan Yu, lest he failed at the critical moment. He sent a letter to Li's tent, ordering him to follow the instructions. Burning with indignation, Li took his men and set off east without visiting Wei to formally take his leave. Meanwhile, Wei went on ahead and finally came out of the desert, to the foothills and forests of modern-day northern Mongolia. There, right at the edge, he ran straight into the Shan Yu's army. Far from being afraid, though, Wei was thankful for this chance to capture China's greatest enemy. Wei set up his camp opposite the Shan Yu's and arranged his armoured carriages in a circle, the same sort of formation, though on a much larger scale, as that used by settlers and their wagons in the American Old West. At the same time, he sent out a force of 5,000 cavalry to attack the Xiong Nu. The Shan Yu assembled twice that number and rode out with them in reply. The two groups advanced towards each other, lit by the setting sun, when a dust storm suddenly blew up. The two armies lost sight of each other, but Wei used the weather to his advantage. He sent out two more groups to the left and right of the Xiongnu riders, flanking them. When the weather cleared, the Shan Yu saw that he was surrounded, and knew there was no hope for his men. Taking a few hundred of his finest soldiers, he charged through the encirclement and fled to the northwest. The rest of the battle took place in the dark. It was a bloody mess, with both sides losing a large number of their men. When they realised the Shan Yu had escaped, the Chinese commanders sent a force of light cavalry in pursuit, though of course they had little hope of catching up to him by now. By the end, 10,000 Xiongnu were killed or captured. Sometime afterwards, they attacked a Xiongnu fortress at Mount Tianyan, in the Kanghai Mountains, which belonged to Zhao Xin, that general who had defected. It's unclear whether Zhao was there at the time, though he did not die until a few years later, so perhaps he had escaped with the Shan Yu. The Chinese feasted on the food that had been stored in the fort, and when they had their fill, they burnt the rest. Then, they started the march back home. Li Guang and Zhao Yiji, who had gone up the eastern route, and were meant to reunite with Ai Qing on the other side of the desert, got lost on their way, and ended up turning back to China without meeting the enemy. When Wei Qing and his men finally returned, he sent a clerk to Li, bringing gifts of dried rice and thick wine, but asking why Li had failed to meet up with the rest of the army. Li refused to answer, and after another clerk was sent summoning him to meet Wei, Li went along and proclaimed that he alone was at fault for the army losing its way. When he appeared before Wei's officers, he said, quote, Since I was old enough to have my hair bound up, I have fought over 70 engagements, large and small, with the Xiong Nu. This time, I was fortunate enough to join the General-in-Chief in a campaign against the soldiers of the Shan Yu himself, but he shifted me to another division and sent me riding around the long way. On top of that, I lost my way. Heaven must have planned it this way. Now I am over 60, much too old to stand up to a bunch of petty clerks and their list of charges. There, on the spot, he drew his sword and cut his own throat. When the news spread of his death, the men of the army and even the general civilian population were deeply saddened, and many tears were shed. His career had been unsuccessful compared to Wei Qing and Huo Chubing. It was the tragedy of a man who was a skilled general, but who had never been properly rewarded, and who had had a lot of bad luck. Generalship aside, he was well respected as a good man. It's a sad thing that he ended his life unfulfilled and bitter. The campaign of 119 was, I think, a melancholy victory. The Chinese forces had succeeded in killing and capturing a lot of Xiong Nu, and it seems they broke the Confederacy's confidence. Sima Chen says that the Xiong Nu losses totaled 90,000. After the campaign, the Shan Yu remained north of the Gobi, and began sending envoys asking to resume peaceful relations. Despite these successes, though, the campaign had failed its key objective of capturing the Shan Yu. More problematically, it had been very costly for the Chinese. It had been a difficult march to reach the other side of the Gobi in the first place, and then, after they had finished fighting, they had to make the same march back to China. This difficult journey wasn't helped by Huo Chubing, who, unlike generals such as Li Guang, did not have an eye on the welfare of his men. Sima Chen reports that a few times, when returning from a campaign, 
Hoare's men would be starving while their general still had carriages full of his own food. He was also fond of playing football, and when his army prepared their camps, he would further burden them by having them flatten out a section of ground to use as a pitch. In total, in the 119 campaign, the Chinese lost 20 or 30,000 men and 100,000 horses. The loss of horses was a particularly bad blow and created a temporary shortage of them in China. Despite these losses though, Wu Di was enormously happy with how the campaign had gone. He appointed Wei Qing and Hua Chubing simultaneously to the office of Supreme Commander, which had been vacant since the beginning of his reign. He was particularly pleased with Hua and increased his fiefdom. The campaign of 119 was the peak of Hua's career, and though Wei was losing the spotlight to his nephew, he was still in a pretty good position. They were both still young and could probably picture a bright future for themselves. However, this campaign proved to be the last for both of them. Hua died just three years later, for reasons unknown. Wei died 14 years later, without leading any more campaigns. Seymour explains that the reason he did not lead any more against the Xiongnu was because, after 119, Wu Di's military attention turned towards other targets. However, it's not clear why Wei didn't participate in any of these expeditions. The loss of the generals Hua and Wei turned out to have an important impact on China's overall strategy. Historian Jun Shu Zhang notes that Wu Di's enthusiasm for future campaigns against the Xiongnu depended upon the success of previous campaigns, and since Wei and Hua were the only generals who could reliably deliver a Chinese victory, their leaving the scene meant that Wu Di became more hesitant about future expeditions. In 117, the Chinese had been preparing to launch another campaign against the Xiongnu, but the plans were cancelled when Hua Chubing died. The fact that they couldn't just appoint another general to lead shows how much Wu Di's confidence depended on these two men. After 119, the Xiongnu began asking for a return to the old Heqin system. However, this would not satisfy the Han government. When the first Xiongnu envoy arrived in Chang'an, Wu Di consulted with his ministers on whether they should accept peace. One objected, quote, Since the Xiongnu have just recently been defeated and their spirits broken, they should be treated as foreign vassals and required to come to the border in spring and autumn to pay their respects to the Han. In the days of Hei Qin, the relationship between China and the Xiongnu had been framed as one of equals. This was most apparent in the rhetoric of the letters and edicts of Wen Di, where the Shan Yu and the Emperor were referred to as brothers, and there was an idea that the two leaders shared the entire world, each having sovereignty over their respective peoples and lands. Now though, Wu Di wanted the Xiongnu to pay tribute to China and acknowledge the Emperor as their overlord, similarly to the relationships China had with the barbarian states to the south. The Chinese sent an envoy to the Xiongnu to sort out their new relationship. Naturally enough though, Shan Yu Yu did not take kindly to the idea of becoming a Chinese tributary. Enraged, he imprisoned the Chinese envoy, Ren Chang. In 114, Shan Yu Yijixie died, and was succeeded by his son Wu Wei. Wu Wei, while he was not going to just keel over and kowtow to the emperor, was also cautious and did not want to provoke the Chinese. In 111, the Chinese sent two armies into Xiongnu territory, totaling 25,000 cavalry. However, neither of them ran into any Xiongnu riders. The next year, Wu Di himself inspected 180,000 cavalry near the border and attempted to provoke the Xiongnu into attacking. An envoy named Guo Ji was sent to Shanyu Wu Wei. He attempted to scare Wu Wei by reporting how the Han had recently defeated one of the tribal states to the south, and if the Shanyu did not do something, he might be next. He said, quote, The head of the king of southern Yue hangs above the northern gates of the Han capital. Now, if you are able, advance and engage the Han forces in battle. The son of heaven has led his troops in person and is waiting on the border. But if you are not able, then turn your face south and acknowledge yourself a subject of the Han. Why this useless running away and hiding off north in the desert, in a cold and bitter land where there is no water or pasture, it will get you nowhere. The insult pissed off Wu Wei so much that he executed the courtier who had brought Guo Ji before him. However, he was wise enough not to take the bait, and he did not move to attack. The army Wu Di was inspecting was disbanded. Over the next few years, the Shan Yu sent more envoys to the Han, asking for a return to the old peace system. However, China insisted that the Xiongnu must now act subserviently, and this was not something Wu Wei could stomach. One of the most egregious insults 
was the Han's request that one of the Shan Yu's sons be sent to live in Chang'an as a hostage. When the envoy who was sent with the demand arrived, Wu Wei replied to the request with outrage and pined for the old H Hin system. He said, quote, This is not the way things were done under the old alliance. Under the old alliance, the Han always sent us an imperial princess, as well as allotments of silks, foodstuffs, and other goods, in order to secure peace, while we for our part refrained from making trouble on the border. Now you want to go against the old ways, and make me send my son as a hostage. I have no use for such proposals. For his part, Wu Di was just as determined to force the Xiongnu into an inferior position, as Wu Wei was to return to the old equal relationship. For Wu Di, defeating the Xiongnu was not just a matter of strategic interest. There was also a personal element. He wanted to repay the Xiongnu for the insults they had laid at the early rulers of the Han Dynasty, his forebears. In an edict from 101, he said, quote, Emperor Gao Zhu has left us the task of avenging the difficulties which he suffered at Ping Cheng. Furthermore, during the reign of Empress Liu, the Shan Yu sent to the court a most treasonable and insulting letter, the one suggesting that Mao and Empress Liu hook up. In ancient times, when Duke Xiang of Qi avenged an insult, which one of his ancestors nine generations earlier had suffered, Confucius praised his conduct in the spring and autumn annals. The two sides were at a diplomatic stalemate. They continued sending envoys and made diplomatic manoeuvres. The Chinese even built a palace for the Shan Yu in Chang'an, and later a whole city called Xiang Cheng, which translates to City for Receiving Surrender, in anticipation of the Shan Yu caving in and acknowledging the Emperor as his superior. The reigns of the Shan Yus became shorter, some lasting just a couple of years, and at times they were occupied by very young men. Even one so young, he was called the boy Shan Yu. The Chinese did what they could to interfere in these secessions, and engineer crises within the ranks of the Xiongnu. However, what was really needed was another military or strategic victory, which could cow the Shan Yu into obedience. But the northern border was already secure, and making further campaigns across the desert would be costly and very risky. But there was a new theatre which could be opened up, where the Han might be able to achieve a decisive victory over the Xiongnu, Thus, the struggle between the Han and the Xiongnu turned into a competition over the peoples living in Central Asia, the area known to the Chinese as CU, the Western Regions. The Western Regions were inhabited by a variety of people, some of whom were nomadic and some settled. There were large powerful kingdoms such as Daiyuan and Yuezhi, as well as small city-states such as Lawlan and Gushi. The region had fallen under the influence of the Xiongnu when Mao Dun had defeated the Yuezhi, a nomadic people during the period when the Xiongnu Confederacy was growing and expanding. The region became very important to the Xiongnu, as a place where they could trade for goods that their nomadic pastoral economy could not produce, including grain and manufactured luxuries. When the Xiongnu had been receiving tribute from China, or had been in a position to raid it, these western regions had been a secondary priority for them. But now that they weren't receiving Chinese tribute, and were not in a position to raid, the importance of the western regions had grown so much that the area came to be called the right arm of the Xiongnu. The Chinese first came into official contact with the people of these lands through the journey of an envoy named Zhang Qian. Early in Wu Di's reign in 138, before the campaigns against the Xiongnu began, Zhang was sent out west to see if he could form an alliance with the Yuezhi people, those nomads whom Mao Dun had defeated. The Yuezhi had been forced to move west after their defeat, and later, Mao Maodun's son, Jiju, executed their king and had his skull fashioned into a drinking vessel. The Chinese suspected that they might hold on to a grudge against the Xiongnu, and be willing to join in the fight against them. When the emperor had put out the word that he was intending to send someone to talk to the Yuezhi, Zhang, who was a palace attendant, volunteered to go. He was accompanied by Gan Fu, a Xiongnu slave whose knowledge of the land they were to travel through came in handy and who was able to hunt for food as they travelled. There was also about a hundred other men who accompanied them as part of the mission, 
although whether some died on the way or chose to settle in the new lands, only Zhang Chan and Gan Fu made it back to China. At the time that their mission first set out, China was cut off in the western regions by the Xiongnu and their allies, the Qiang. Though the relationship between Han and Xiongnu was in the relatively peaceful phase, it was still a risky endeavour for a Chinese envoy to travel through Xiongnu lands. And indeed, Zhang and his company were derailed early on, when they were caught by the Xiongnu and taken to the Shanyu, Junchen. When Junchen found out that they were on a diplomatic mission to the UAG, it ticked him off. The Xiongnu did not send messengers through China to the Yue kingdoms in the south. What business did the Chinese have sending their envoys through Xiongnu lands to talk to the peoples beyond? He imprisoned the company, preventing them from going any further. However, they weren't treated too badly. Sima Chen describes Zhang as having a good personality. He was, quote, a man of great strength, determination, and generosity. He trusted others, and in turn was liked by the barbarians. Perhaps because of these qualities, Zhang was given a Xiongnu woman to take as a wife. After ten years of imprisonment, Zhang, Gan Fu, and his new wife managed to escape, though unfortunately we are not told how. They continued the journey west to seek out the Weiji. They travelled for 20 or 30 days, and reached a kingdom which they called Da Yuan, which was in the Fergana Basin, in the eastern protrusion of modern day Uzbekistan. Zhang Chan estimated that it was 10,000 li, or 4,000 kilometres, west of China. According to his reports, the kingdom had around 70 fortified cities, with a population of several hundred thousand. The people made their living by farming rice and wheat, and used grapes to make wine. Despite being a settled society, they were proficient in horseback archery. Zhang also noted that the horses of Daiyuan were a very fine stock, and appeared to sweat blood. Modern scholars believe that this blood sweating was due to a particular parasite that lives under the skin of horses and other animals. The Chinese made a note of this fact when Zhang returned. The quality of an army's horses were of significant strategic importance and the Chinese, whose own breed of horses were notoriously inferior compared to those of the Xiongnu and other nomads, were always on the lookout for specimens that could be used to produce better animals. Zhang met with the king of Daiyuan, and promised him that the Han would reward him if he gave Zhang guides and interpreters to lead them to the Weiji. Gladly, the king of Daiyuan provided Zhang with some men, who could help him. The guides took him to the land of the Kangju, a nomadic people who lived about 800 kilometres north of Daiyuan, in Transoxania. The region had been a satrapy of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, and Alexander the Great had led his armies there about two centuries previously. According to Zhang, the land occupied by the Kangju was small, and they had about 80 or 90,000 skilled archers. They were surrounded by strong neighbours, and acknowledged both the Xiongnu and the Yuezhi as their sovereigns. From the Kangju, they travelled south, and there they finally met the UAG. The UAG also lived in Transoxania, with the Oxus River forming their southern border. Though they had been driven from their original homelands around the Chilean Mountains by the Xiongnu, they were fairly happy with where they lived now. The land was fertile, and they were seldom troubled by neighbouring peoples. Zhang reported that they moved from place to place with their herds, and altogether could muster a hundred or two hundred thousand archers. To the disappointment of Zhang Qian, the leader of the UAG, the son of the king who had been killed by the Xiongnu and had his skull made into a cup, was not interested in avenging his father. He was enjoying the riches of his kingdom, and China was too far away to bother with. Dejected, Zhang moved on to new lands. The next place he went to was Da Xia, which was the Chinese name for Bactria, the region around the upper Oxus River. It lay to the south of the UAG. The people of this region were settled, living in cities and farming the land. Zhang put the population at a million. They had a strong commercial sector to their economy, and goods from all over the place could be found in their markets. Zhang even saw some Chinese goods, like bamboo and cloth, which had found their way to Da Xia, along trade routes unknown to the Han. At some point, Da Xia had been conquered by the UAG, and now they were under their influence. They did not have a leader that united the whole land, but rather each city had its own chieftain. From Darcia, Zhang went east through the mountains, hoping to return to China by travelling over the Tibetan Plateau, the land occupied by the Qiang. However, at some point on his way, he was captured again by the Xiongnu. They were imprisoned for one year, until the Shanyu Junchen died, and his heir was usurped by Yi Jixie. The instability of the Xiongnu surrounding this transition provided Zhang and Ko with an opportunity to escape again, 
and again we aren't told the details of how they got away. Finally, in 126 BC, 12 years after they had set out, Zhang Qian, Gan Fu, and Zhang Xiongnu wife made it back to China. Though they had failed in their objective of making an alliance with the Yuezhi, the information they brought back about the western regions was hot stuff for the Han court. When the mission had first departed, the emperor was still a boy, and the relationship with the Xiongnu had been peaceful. Now, Wu Di was a young man, and regular campaigns against the Xiongnu had been happening for several years. Any news about potential advantages that could be gained in the West was welcome. Zhang was rewarded with the position of palace counsellor, and Gan Fu was named Lord Who Carries Out His Mission. Zhang submitted a report to the Emperor, describing not only the peoples and places he had personally visited, but also passing on information that he had heard about countries that lay even further afield. Some of these included Parthia, which he called Anxi, Mesopotamia, which he called Tiaoji, and India, which he called Shendu. There were also nomadic peoples, such as the Wu Sun, who were nominally subjects of the Xiongnu and the Yansai. A conception began to form in the Emperor's mind, and in the collective mind of the, of the Han government, that these people of the West could be brought under Chinese sway if they were showered with Chinese goods, and the Emperor could prove his position by drawing in exotic goods from these faraway places. Drawing in products from periphery provinces to the capital had long been an element of Chinese monarchical display. How much more impressive would it be if they could attain goods from people more than 10,000 li away? Sima Chen concludes his reproduction of Zhang's report with this paragraph. Quote, Thus, the emperor learned of Da Yuan, Da Xia, An Si, and the others, all great states rich in unusual products, whose people cultivated the land and made their living much in the same way as the Chinese. All these states, he was told, were militarily weak and prized hand goods and wealth. He also learned that to the north of them lived the Yuezhi and Kangju people, who were strong in arms but who could be persuaded by gifts and, pro and the prospect of gain to acknowledge allegiance to the Han court. If it were only possible to win over these states by peaceful means, the emperor thought, he could then extend his domain 10,000 li, attract to his court men of strange customs who could come translating and retranslating their languages, and his might would become known to all the lands within the four seas. On account of the Chinese goods he had seen in Darsia, which the locals said had been bought in India, to their southeast, Zhang theorised that there must be a way to get to India, and thence to Asia, and the rest of the western regions, by going south from Shu, a commander in China's southwest. Such a route would avoid the dangers of going through the Xiongnu and Chiang territory. Excited by the potential, Wu Di appointed Zhang to organise some expeditions south, and try and find a way. However, the parties that Zhang sent out were harassed by the tribal peoples who lived there. According to Sima Chen, these were anarchic people without chieftains, who plundered and murdered any Han envoys that passed through their lands. Thus, the missions south were called off. During the next few years, Zhang acted as a subordinate commander in some of the campaigns against the Xiongnu, serving under Wei Qing. For his performance in these campaigns, he was enfeoffed as Bo Wang Marquis. In 121, he accompanied Li Guang on the campaign launched from Yorbei Ping. This was the one where Li's army ran into a massive horde of Xiongnu and emerged victorious after being completely wiped out. Zhang was meant to have rendezvoused with Li's army, but he was late and did not arrive till after the battle. He was sentenced to death for this failure. However, he was able to commute the sentence by paying a fine and giving up his noble title. China's situation vis-à-vis -vis the western regions changed dramatically in that same year, 121, because of Hua Chubing's conquest of the Qilian Mountains and the subsequent surrender of the Xiongnu Hunye King. This left a gap on the western frontier, through which the Chinese could send their envoys without having to go through Xiongnu or Chiang territory. Zhang, though he had recently been demoted, was still often called upon by the emperor when Wu Di wanted to ask about the western regions. Zhang suggested to Wu Di that the Han try to make an alliance with the Wu Sun, a nomadic people whom the Xiongnu claimed sovereignty over. The king of the Wu Sun was a man named Lie Jiaomi. According to legend, when Lie Jiaomi's father was still king, the Xiongnu had defeated the Wu Sun, killed Lie Jiaomi's father, and left the baby Lie Jiaomi out in the wilderness to die. However, Lie Jiaomi was kept alive by wild animals, including being suckled by a wolf and brought meat by crows. When the Shan Yu found out, he thought that Lie Jiaomi must have divine protection of some kind, and decided to take him under his wing. 
Liao Jiame grew up to lead the Wusun as a subject people of the Xiongnu. Other versions say that it was actually the Yue Ji who attacked the Wusun and killed the old king, forcing Liao Jiame to flee to the Xiongnu and become their subject. When the Shan Yu Jiju died and was succeeded by Jun Chen, Liao Jiame led the Wusun west, and they became something more like an independent nation. The Xiongnu attempted to attack them, but the armies they sent after them were defeated. The Wu soon became a powerful presence in the region, and eventually acted as Xiongnu allies, and were important facilitators of Xiongnu influence. Zhang Qian believed that the Wu Sun could be bought over with hand gifts and wealths, and that by turning this important Xiongnu ally to the hand, the whole region could be brought to, over, could be brought to follow. Wu Di approved the idea, and around the year 115, sent Zhang at the head of a 300-man party to try and conclude an alliance with the Wu Sun. However, when Zhang arrived, he found that the Wu Sun weren't really in a position to make an alliance. The Ejiame himself, impressed by the massive amounts of gold, silk and livestock that the emissaries had brought with them, and tantalised by the promise that a Han princess would be sent as a bride, was more than willing to acquiesce to Zhang's demand that he prostrate himself in reverence of the emperor. However, his high ministers were opposed to the idea. For the Wu Sun, Han China was a faraway land that they knew little about. Meanwhile, the powerful Xiongnu confederacy was right next to them. Declaring for the Han and incurring the wrath of the Xiongnu seemed like a pretty bad move. Moreover, the Wu Sun people at this time were divided into different groups, due to a dispute over royal secession. The Eiji army was an old man, and potential heirs each had men under their command, ready to fight it out when the Eiji army passed it away. Passed away. Though he was nominally the king, Liao Jiame didn't feel like he was in a position to speak for his whole people. Thus, no alliance was concluded. However, the Wu Sun did agree to exchange some of their horses for the gifts that Zhang had brought, and they sent some of their own envoys back to China with Zhang to see what it was like. Zhang also sent some members of his party as envoys to the nearby states that he had visited on his first expedition, including the UAG and Darcia, as well as to areas that he had only heard about like Parthia and India. The men who were sent on these trips were accompanied by men of the Wu Sun, who acted as guides and interpreters. Thus, though the mission didn't achieve its goal, it was a stepping stone for China to begin building a diplomatic presence in the region. When he returned from the journey, Zhang was honoured with the post of Superintendent of State Visits, one of the nine ministers. A year or so after, he died. He had been very important in setting the wheels in motion for Chinese interaction with the West, and even though he was gone now, those wheels would continue spinning faster and faster. Shortly after Zhang's death, the assistant envoys he had sent to the various states began returning to China, accompanied by diplomats from the countries they had visited. The rate of exchange increased rapidly. Anywhere from 5 to 10 or more parties were sent out each year, and they stayed abroad for years at a time. Some of these parties had several hundred men. In the western regions, rumours spread of the immensely wealthy empire to the east, whence these envoys hailed. Rudy himself would sometimes take foreign envoys on tours around his empire, taking them to the eastern coast and showing them the sea, entertaining them with wrestling matches and unusual animals, and lavishing them with immense feasts. In turn, these states sent their own exotic goods to China, as Rudy had hoped. Particularly noted were great bird eggs and magicians from Parthia. The Chinese learned new skills from foreign entertainers and implemented them into their own styles of performance. Foreign plants, including grapes for wine, were brought to China, and grown in the emperor's own palaces and gardens. The Han were most excited to acquire horses from these people. At some point, Weidi had used the Book of Changes to divine that so-called heavenly horses could be acquired from the West. Any horses the Chinese could get would be an asset, but the specimens they most desired were the blood-sweating horses of Da Yuan. For now, though, Da Yuan refused to give any away. The cultural exchange with the West wasn't all positive. Weedy was so eager to explore the West that he let basically anybody act as an official envoy, and rewarded those who told the most fabulous stories. The promotions Zhang Qian had received after returning from his first mission set people's expectations for what a successful mission to the West could bring you. They saw that you could be highly rewarded, and that it was a way to redeem your career if you had fallen afoul of the Emperor. As a result, the missions were often carried out by dishonest and undiplomatic persons. Some of them plundered the local people, and others embezzled the gifts they were carrying for the foreign states to buy foreign goods for their own enjoyment. Some of the cities on their way began closing their gates to the hand missions, which was quite inconvenient. 
The route they travelled went through a region of salt lakes and wasn't especially abundant in food. Some of the missions lost as many as half of their members on the way for lack of provisions. To make matters worse, some of these city-states started to attack the Han envoys. The problem was the way that the western regions perceived the Chinese. The peoples of these regions, especially those from Dayuan on west, knew China as a wealthy country, but not one to be feared. They considered that it was too far away to be any real danger to them. In fact, the wealth of China almost ended up working against its diplomatic clout. Because these countries were aware of how rich the empire was, they considered it an insult if they found the gifts from the Han envoys to be unsatisfactory, and they expected the envoys to pay for everything along their journey, rather than providing anything themselves. In short, China was seen as a gold mine to be exploited, not as a powerful empire to be respected. It didn't help that the Xiongnu, whom the western regions were familiar with as a military power, maintained an intimidating presence in the region. The Xiongnu realised that China was making overtures to the west shortly after Zhang's mission to the Wu Sun, and it infuriated the Shan Yu. He quickly started sending his own envoys to these states, and because of the reputation of the Xiongnu, they were treated much better than the Han envoys. There's a great paragraph from the records which lays out the real politic logic behind how the western regions interacted with the two great powers of Asia. Quote, the lands from that of the Wu Sun on west to An Si were situated nearer to the Xiongnu than to China, and it was well known that the Xiongnu had earlier caused the Uaji people great suffering. Therefore, whenever a Xiongnu envoy appeared in the region and carrying credentials from the Shan Yu, he was escorted from state to state and provided with food and no one dared to detain him or cause him any difficulty. In the case of the Han envoys, however, if they did not hand out silks or other goods, they were given no food, and unless they purchased the animals in markets, they could get no mounts for their riders. This was because the people considered the Han too far away to bother with. They also believed that the Han had plenty of goods and money, and it was therefore proper to make the envoys pay for whatever they wanted. As may be seen, they were much more afraid of the Xiong Nu envoys than of those from the Han. The splendour of Han was not enough to make the peoples of the West forget their terror of the Xiongnu. It looked like Wu Di's dream of winning over the Western regions through peaceful means was being dashed by the reality of power politics. Perhaps it was inevitable then that China started to present itself to the West with more violent displays. The first military campaign targeted one of these Western states was launched in 108 BC. It was aimed at two city-states, Lawland and Gushi. Lawland was near the Salt Lake Lop Nor, and was the first city on the route to the western regions, acting as a sort of gateway for China. Gushi was located further north, in the foothills of the Tian Shan mountain range. It was a similar sort of gateway for the Xiongnu. Thus, they were strategically valuable cities. Both had been plundering the Han envoy missions, which gave the Chinese a useful excuse to attack them. The campaign went very smoothly. General Zhao Ponu, commanding a force of a mere 700 light cavalry, managed to conquer Law Lan. General Wang Hui, who had previously acted as an envoy and had experienced first-hand mistreatment at the hands of Law Lan, conquered Gu Shi. Han military presence in the West had gotten off to a great start, and it seemed to have the desired effect of impressing the other states. In 105, Lie Jiami, the king of the Wu Sun, asked to marry a Han princess, and gave as a betrothal gift 1,000 horses to the Chinese. However, the Xiongnu weren't going to give up the western regions without a fight. They started using diplomatic devices out of the Chinese toolbox. After Liu Jiami received the Han princess, the Xiongnu sent one of their own women to marry him as well. In this struggle, the Xiongnu seemed to have won out. The Han princess was named Bride of the Right, while the Xiongnu one was Bride of the Left, the place of honour. Later, Liu Jiame even passed on the hand bride to his grandson, Chen Chu, claiming that he himself was too old for her. In 104, another campaign set off, this time aimed at Da Yuan. Earlier, Wu Di had sent envoys bearing gifts of gold, including a golden statue of a horse, to Da Yuan, hoping to exchange them for some of the Da Yuan's famed blood-sweating horses. He was hoping in particular to get some from the capital city Er Shi, which were reported to be particularly fine. However, when the envoys arrived, they found that the Daiyuan were unwilling to give them any of the Urshi horses. The Daiyuan prized them as much as the Han did, and thought that even if they refused, they were safely out of reach of any Han reprisal. Highly offended, the Chinese envoys smashed the golden horse they had brought as a gift, 
and departed for home. But the king of Daiyuan sent messengers ahead to the city-state of Yucheng on their eastern border, which the Han envoys were going to pass through on their way back. He asked the king of Yucheng to kill the Han envoys when they arrived, and the king of Yucheng did so. When the outrageous news reached Wu Di, the emperor determined to shatter Daiyuan's sense of security and claim the Urshi horses by force. The composition of the army that was assembled is interesting. Rather than the professional Chinese soldiers that had been the meat of the armies sent against the Xiongnu earlier on, this one was composed of 6,000 cavalry drawn from the dependent states, that is, surrendered barbarians like the Hunye king, and 20 or 30,000, quote, young men of bad reputation, who were rounded up from all over China and put to work in the emperor's army. The campaign was led by Li Guangli, brother of Wu Di's current favourite concubine, Lady Li. Wu Di wanted twin fief Li Guangli to please his Lady Li, and hoped that Li would prove himself worthy of a marquisate. Because of Xiao Ponu's easy victory with a tiny force over Luo Lan, the emperor reckoned that these western states would be a pushover. One advisor suggested that an army of a mere 3,000 would be capable of defeating Da Yuan. The attempt proved disastrous. The marching army terrified the cities of the Salt Lakes, which closed their gates and refused to give them any food. Li was forced to attack some of them in an attempt to feed his men. However, if a city held out for more than a few days, then besieging it became costlier than it was worth, so they would hurry on. By the time they reached Yu Cheng, there was only a few thousand men left in the army, the others having starved. They tried to attack the city, but failed. Li consulted with his officers, and decided they did not have the men left to try another attack. Dejectedly, they turned back to China. Li sent a message ahead to tell the emperor what had happened. Wu Di was enraged when he found out. He ordered that any returning man of Li's army who tried to pass the Jade Gates, a fortified mountain pass in the recently established Dunhuang Commandery, was to be executed on the spot. Frightened, when Li eventually reached Dunhuang, he remained camped there without attempting to go through the gates. Now that they were back in relatively tame lands, he slowly nursed his remaining army, which was now reduced to a fifth or even less of its original strength, and awaited further orders. They remained camped in Dunhuang for more than a year. In the meantime, the direct warfare between the Chinese and the Xiongnu started up again. The last Chinese campaign against the Xiongnu had been in 110, when Wudi had led 180,000 horsemen to the border and unsuccessfully tried to provoke the Xiongnu into attacking. Since then, the two nations had been exchanging envoys, trying to come to some sort of peace agreement, but neither side was willing to compromise. To make matters worse, there had been misunderstandings regarding some of these diplomats, in 107, a Xiongnu envoy to China fell sick, and though according to Sima Chen the Chinese doctors did everything in their power to treat him, the man died anyway, and the Xiongnu believed that there was some foul play involved. In retaliation, they imprisoned a Chinese envoy, Lu Chongguo, for three years. Things soured even more when the Shanyu Wu Wei died in 105, and was succeeded by his son, Wu Shi Lu, who was still a child. The Xiongnu chafed under Wu Shilu's leadership. According to Sima, the boy had, quote, a great fondness for warfare and slaughter. And to make matters worse, the winter of 104-3 was a difficult one for the Xiongnu, and many of their herd animals died. One of the Xiongnu ministers, the chief commandant of the left, sent a secret message to the Han, saying that if they could just provide him with some soldiers, he would attack and kill the Shanyu. In the summer of 103, the General Zhao Ponu was sent with 20,000 riders to meet with the chief commandant of the left and help him carry out this plot. Unfortunately for Zhao and the chief commandant though, Shan Yu Wu Shilu discovered the conspiracy before they could rendezvous. He executed the chief commandant and sent some men against the Han army. Zhao Ponu began a controlled retreat, killing several thousand Xiongnu on his way. They headed for the recently built fortified supply base in the Gobi, called Shaoxiang Cheng, the city for receiving surrender. However, before they got there, they were surrounded by a massive force of 80,000 Xiongnu, just 200 kilometers away from the city. Zhao Ponu was captured alive, and his army surrendered. It was a big win for the Confederacy. Given these events, Weidi's ministers and advisors wanted him to disband Li Guangli's army camped in Dunhuang, and concentrate the empire's military energy on the Xiongnu. But Wu Di wouldn't have it. 
He was worried that if he reassigned Lee's army and gave up on Da Yuan, China would lose face in the western regions, and any chance to acquire the blood-sweating horses would be lost. He punished the ministers who were most strongly opposed to making another attempt on Da Yuan, and put a massive amount of effort into rebuilding Li Guangli's army. He freed archers who had been imprisoned and sent them to join the army, and did another roundup of men of bad reputation. 60,000 new soldiers were sent to join Li's army. An even larger force of 180,000 garrison troops was sent to the northwestern commandery Jiu Chuan, presumably to block any Xiongnu attempt to intercept the Dayuan army or harass its supply train as they made their journey. Note was taken of the reasons for the first campaign's failure. The army was provided with 100,000 oxen, as well as 30,000 horses and tens of thousands of donkeys, mules and camels, so that they could carry more supplies with them and wouldn't have to depend on the city-states on their way to feed them. A large number of criminals of certain classes were called upon to work the supply train for Lee's army. Lee was also provided with some experts in a few different fields, who could help him out. It was known that the city of Urshi, their target, had no wells, and got its water from nearby rivers. Therefore, hydro-engineers who could divert the courses of these rivers and deprive the city of water were called upon. He was also granted two men who were particularly knowledgeable about horses, who, after they captured the city, were to judge the finest Urshi horses and bring them back to China. In addition, 50 subordinate commanders were appointed, providing Li with a wealth of military expertise he could tap into. According to Sima, quote, The whole empire was thrown into a turmoil, relaying orders and providing men and supplies for the attack on Da Yuan. The campaign launched in the autumn in the autumn of 102. Because his army was so much larger than last time, Li Guangli decided to divide it and have different sections take different routes, so as to spread out the burden of feeding and sheltering across more of the people of the region. On the way, the city-states were much more welcoming than last time. Most of them opened their gates and gave gifts of food to the Chinese soldiers. But there were some that resisted. The city Luntor would not let Li's men in. Therefore, they laid it to siege and after a few days managed to take it and massacre the population. There was also the city Yu Cheng, the one which had defeated Li's army in the first attempt, and forced him to turn back. Li himself bypassed it, as he was keen to press on to Er Shi without wasting time. One of the subordinate commanders attempted to conquer Yu Cheng, with his division of a thousand troops, and again the city prevailed and defeated the Chinese soldiers. When he heard of the failure, Li sent another subordinate to try and conquer the city, and this time the Chinese were successful. The king of Yucheng tried to escape to the nomadic Kangju people, however they ended up handing him over to the Chinese. I mention this episode purely because the four Chinese horsemen who were tasked with escorting the king of Yucheng to General Li apparently referred to him as, quote, the arch enemy of the Han. I just find it darkly humorous in a way that the leader of this little city, which had caused the Chinese a disproportionate amount of trouble, accrued such an evil reputation. Unfortunately for the king of Yucheng, the soldiers who were transporting him decided that it would be better to kill him rather than risk him escaping on the way. Anyway, because the armies were divided in this way, when Li arrived at Urshi, he had just 30,000 men at hand. The men of Urshi attempted a field battle against the Chinese, but were driven off by hand fire power. Remember, the majority of Chinese soldiers were armed with bows or crossbows. Thus, the Daiwan forces retreated into the city and buckled down for a siege. As had been planned, Li used his engineers to divert the rivers away from Urshi, making the siege particularly difficult for the inhabitants. At some time previously, though, Urshi had acquired the services of a Chinese who told them how to dig wells. Thus, the city had at least some water they could draw on, and as far as food went, they had done a good job of stockpiling. The men of Urshi called upon the nomadic Kangju to come to their rescue. Kangju's scouts reached the city, but because they could see that the Han was still in good condition, they hesitated to attack with their main army. They simply camped some ways away, and waited to see what would happen. After 40 days of sieging, with no sign of the Urshi giving up, and the Kangju breathing down his neck, Li attempted an attack on the city, and managed to breach the outer wall. The Chinese captured an enemy nobleman, and the defenders fled to the inner wall. With this retreat to the inner city, the men of Urshi began to consider surrender. The nobles knew that the reason the Han were after them was because their king had refused to give them any of the royal horses. Thus, they killed their king, and sent one of their number out to negotiate with the Han. 
He promised General Lee that if the Chinese put down their weapons, then the city would feed them and let them pick some of the royal horses to take home. However, if the Chinese continued to attack, they would slaughter the horses before the Chinese could get any. Lee was aware that the city could hold out a while yet, and that the longer the siege dragged on, the more likely the Kangju were to attack the Han. Therefore, he agreed to the terms. The Chinese fed well on Urshi's stockpiles, and chose 20 or 30 of the best horses to take back with them, as well as 3,000 lesser quality horses. They also chose one of the nobles to be the new king of Daiyuan. Then, they set off on the return trip to China. The Chinese victory over Daiyuan was a turning point for its relations with the western regions. It showed that China was not just a wealthy country, but a powerful one. The cities between China and Daiyuan all paid tribute to the Han court, and sent princes back with the returning Chinese armies as hostages. The king whom the Chinese appointed for Daiyuan was later killed by the nobles of that country, but China quickly established a friendly relationship with the new king. The Chinese took the first steps towards colonising the region. They built a wall along the route to Law Lan, the first city on their way, and set up supply depots for their envoys to use, and later extended the fortifications from Law Lan to Lun Tor further west. These measures made the route safer for trading parties. Ministers started drawing up plans for fully-fledged settlements in the region. However, Wu Di wasn't too keen to put these plans into action yet. The Daiyuan campaigns had been immensely costly. Li Guangli's army had spent four years in the field since the first failed attempt to conquer Urshi. Historian Yu Yingxi says that the expeditions were the most expensive in the history of the dynasty. Moreover, despite how well supplied they were, and the fairly low number of battle deaths in the second campaign, many soldiers still lost their lives on the way from general attrition. By the time the army re-entered the Jade Gates, they numbered just 10,000 men, 50,000 less than the number that had departed in 102. Sima Qian blames this on the generals and officers mistreating their men. As a consequence of these tremendous losses, for the rest of his reign, when there was trouble in the western regions, Wei Di preferred to use the forces of the cities from the region to quell it, rather than relying on Chinese troops. There were some more efforts made in Wu Di's reign to deepen hand control over the region. For example, a force of several hundred agricultural soldiers, men who could build and work farms, but also be ready to fight if necessary, were sent to establish a garrison at Yun Tor. However, as an emperor, Wu Di had done more than enough by conquering this territory that had been virtually unexplored at the start of his reign. It would be up to his successors to colonise it and really bring it into the Chinese fold. The other factor taking Wu Di's attention away from the western regions was, of course, the Xiongnu. Under the boy Shan Yu, Wu Shi Lu, and his successors, the Xiongnu launched a series of vicious campaigns against the Chinese, attacking frontier fortifications like the city for receiving surrender, and even managing raids into the border commanderies. The Han retaliated. Li Guangli led a few campaigns after he returned from Daiyuan. However, China just couldn't manage the same sort of campaigns that had characterised the early phase of the war, and it couldn't produce the same results. So many horses had been spent in all these years of warfare that many of the armies now had large numbers of infantry, limiting their mobility. So much resources had been used up that the armies that did go weren't as well provisioned as before. Moreover, the Xiongnu achieved some devastating victories over the attacking Han armies. One expedition worth noting was that of Li Ling, the grandson of that old, f- unfulfilled general, Li Guang. Li Ling was a commander in the same style as his grandfather, ready to share in the hardships and difficulties of his men. In 99 BC, he participated in a campaign under the command of Li Guang Li. Li Guang Li was planning to attack the wise king of the right around the Tian Shan mountain range, and wanted Li Ling to protect his baggage train. Instead, Li Ling suggested that he could be better used by going deep into Xiongnu territory to draw some of the enemy away. Wu Di was hesitant to approve Li Ling's, Li Ling's mission, since there was no cavalry to spare. However, Li Ling confidently asserted that he could accomplish it with just 5,000 infantry. After 30 days' march, Li Ling managed to reach the Shan Yu's own camp, where his army was confronted with a Xiongnu force of apparently 30,000, or perhaps even 80,000 cavalry. Such numbers should have been impossible for Li and his men to withstand, but Li demonstrated that with some discipline and smart positioning, the Chinese crossbowman could hold his own against a horde of horse archers. 
he took up position in a narrow mountain pass and placed supply wagons to make the valley even tighter. With pikemen in front and archers behind, they sent a devastating volley of arrows into the Xiongnu ranks. It was enough to drive the Shan Yu and his men off for the time being, and Li began to retreat back to Chinese territory. All the while, the Xiongnu followed in pursuit, and for ten days they fought a running battle. The seriously wounded Chinese were carried in the wagons, the moderately wounded pulled them, and those who were able kept on shooting at the Xiongnu. At one point, the Shan Yu himself was forced to abandon his horse and escape the Chinese arrow fire on foot. But the Chinese began running low on arrows, and couldn't repel the Xiong Ru indefinitely. In a letter to his friend Renau, Sima Qian describes the expedition, using a vivid romantic sort of language that rarely appears in the main body of the records. Quote, the infantry Li Ling commander did not come up to 5,000. They marched deep into the barbarian territory, strode up to the ruler's court and dangled the bait, as it were, right before the tiger's jaws. In fearless ranks, they shouted a challenge to the powerful barbarians, gazing up at the numberless hosts. For over ten days, they continued in combat with the Shan Yu. The enemy fell in disproportionate numbers. Those who tried to rescue the dead and wounded could not even save themselves. The barbarian lords in their robes of felt trembled with fear. They summoned their wise kings of the left and right, and called out all the men who could use a bow. The whole nation descended together upon all our men and surrounded them. They fought their way along for a thousand miles, until their arrows were all gone and the road blocked. The relief forces did not come, and our dead and injured lay heaped up. But Li Ling with one cry gave courage to his army, so that every man raised himself up and wept. Washed in blood and choked with tears, they stretched out their empty bows and warded off the bare blades of the foe. North again they turned and fought to the death with the enemy. In fact, what happened was that one officer of Li's army betrayed them to the Xiongnu, telling the Shan Yu that the Chinese were out of ammunition and were not expecting reinforcements. This gave the Xiongnu the confidence to cut off Li's retreat. Li's army was stuck in the narrow valley, and the Xiongnu showered them with arrows and pushed boulders down the hills to come crashing into the Chinese camp. The Chinese were forced to fight with whatever they could lay their hands on, including cart axles. Still, they managed to hold out till night time. Li knew the situation was hopeless. In the cover of dark, he cut down the army's flags and buried their treasures. Then, he gave the remaining supplies to his men, and told them to scatter and escape into the night, and try and get back to China. To give an idea of how bad the supply situation was, each man was given for their food just half a litre of rice and a block of ice. Li himself surrendered to the Xiongnu, knowing that Wu Di would not treat kindly a general who had failed to die with his defeated army. In the end, only 400 of his men made it back to China. The story of Li is notable not just for its drama, but as an extreme illustration of the characteristics of these later phase campaigns, their reliance on infantry, the lack of supplies, and the devastating proportion of losses. Ultimately, Wu Di was not able to achieve the full subjugation of the Xiongnu in his reign. However, he had forever turned the tide against them. He had almost completely won the western regions, and shown that even if the Xiongnu retreated beyond the desert, they weren't safe from the Chinese armies. The war put huge pressure on the Xiongnu political system. The weakness of its decentralised distribution of power flared up into gaping cracks, with things like the surrender of the Hunye king, resulting in a huge loss of territory for the Xiongnu, while the lack of a stable bureaucracy and ministerial structure threw the confederacy into trouble whenever someone like the boy Shan Yu succeeded to the throne. Most of all, Wu Di brought an end to the notion that the Shan Yu and the Emperor could share the world as equals. Further Han Emperors would not be content until the Xiongnu were subserviently paying tribute like any other barbarian people. It might seem like we've reached the end of the episode here, but actually, while the confrontation with the Xiongnu and the Han expansion into the western regions was the most important, were the most important events regarding foreign nations in Wu Di's reign, 
there were actually things going on with China's other neighbours that are interesting too. Apart from the expansion west, there was also significant expansion southward. The general region south of China was not as politically important to the Han as the region to the north, mainly because its inhabitants did not present a significant threat. In the south and the southeast, around the modern provinces of Fujian, Guangdong and Guangxi, and in northern Vietnam, there were small kingdoms that were considered foreign vassals of the Han. Some of these kingdoms we've already encountered in previous episodes, such as Nanyue, Minyue, and Dong'o. For these states, acknowledging the Son of Heaven as their overlord was little more than a convenient way to stay in China's good books. They were not expected to pay regular tribute to Chang'an, like the Chinese kingdoms ruled by members of the Liu family were. In the southwest, the modern provinces Yunnan and Guizhou, there were lots of smaller, mostly sedentary tribes, who as of yet had no formal relationship with the Han. In Wudi's reign, China took over these southerly regions. A combination of conflict between these foreign nations, prospective trade wealth, and Wudi's general expansionist tilt pulled and pushed China further south. A crisis in the Kingdom of Nanyue was triggered in 113 BC, when a Han envoy named Angguo Shaoji was sent there with the suggestion that Nanyue transitioned from being a foreign vassal kingdom to an interior kingdom, like those held by members of the Liu family. This would entail the king of Nanyue making regular visits to Chang'an to pay homage to the emperor, the removal of customs barriers between Nanyue and China, and the implementation of Han law in Nanyue, and the appointment of ministers who were chosen by the Han. Such a loss of sovereignty might usually have been unappealing to Nanyue. However, the timing of the suggestion was well considered. That year, a new king, Zhao Xing, had come to the throne of Nanyue. His mother was a Chinese woman, Jiu, who married Xing's father, Ying Chiu, when he had visited Chang'an while he was still a prince. The new king was young, and as Queen Daoja, Jiu had a lot of influence. Because of her origins, she was inclined to a pro-Chinese policy. The choice of envoy was well considered too. Before Queen Jiu had married Zhao Ying Xiao, she and Anguo Xiaoji had had an affair, and when Anguo came to Nanyue, it was clear that the two still had feelings for each other. Queen Zhou was already unpopular in Nanyue because she was Chinese. Although the Zhao royal family was originally Chinese as well, by now they saw themselves as something distinct from the Han. And her resuming her affair with Anguo Xiaojie did nothing to improve her image. There was a strong political ele- element in Nanyue, led by its chancellor, Liu Jia, that was deeply opposed to becoming an interior kingdom of China. Her unpopularity and this strong opposition only served to make Queen Zhou more anxious to strengthen ties with the Han, seeing it as a way to shore up her position and authority. She pressured her son, the king, into writing a letter to the emperor, formally asking to be made a feudal lord like the interior kings. Liu Jia opposed the move every step of the way, and when the emperor granted the request and sent more envoys to speed along the process of becoming an interior kingdom, Liu Jia refused to help them in any way. Now, Liu Jia held a lot of power beyond his official position. He was very popular amongst the people, even more so than the king. Moreover, he had family members in important positions, including the military, and all of his children were married to members of the royal family. Most of the other ministers and officials of Nanyue were also against closer ties with China. Queen Jiu felt like she could only rely upon the Han envoys to support her. Several times she tried to do away with Liu Jia, and one time even attacked him herself with a spear during a banquet. He was able to escape and was escorted home by the guards outside, who were under the command of his brother. For a while, he had been considering starting a revolt, and this incident convinced him that such a move was his only choice. The queen's efforts to finish off Liu Jia were hamstrung by the fact that the king, though he was still young and otherwise under the sway of his mother, was determined not to execute him. She sent a letter to Chang'an, asking for the emperor to send more help, so that she could get rid of Liu once and for all. Wu Di was a bit unsure of what to do. Should he send more envoys and try and be diplomatic about it, or send an army and deal with Liu by force? He thought about sending an envoy corps of 2,000 envoys, but the man who wanted to lead the corps objected that if the goal was diplomatic pressure, it was excessive, and that if the goal was a show of force, it was insufficient. Eventually, a young man named Han Qianxiu, who had previously served as chancellor for one of the interior kings, boasted that if he were given a force of just 200 braves, he would be able to execute Liu Jia and deal with the problem. 
In the end, Wu Di sent Han Xianxiu, as well as Zhou Yue, Queen Zhou's brother, at the head of a force of 2,000 soldiers. When the Chinese army crossed the border into Nanyue, Liu finally started his revolt. He circulated an order to the whole kingdom, which pronounced, quote, The king is very young, and the queen dowager is a Chinese. Moreover, she has had immoral relations with one of the Han envoys. Her only thought is to make the kingdom a part of China. She intends to take all of the previous goods and vessels of our former rulers and present them to the Son of Heaven, in order to curry favour with him. And as soon as she reaches the capital, the numerous attendants in her party will be seized and sold as slaves. In her haste to snatch a monetary advantage for herself, she disregards the sacred altars of the Zhao family and gives no thought to the future of the state. With the palace guards, who were under his brother's command, he killed Queen Zhou, the king, and the Han envoys. He named another of Zhao Yunqiu's sons, who had been born to a Yue woman, as the new king. When Han Xianxiu's army entered Nanyue, they succeeded in defeating a couple of small towns, and the people of Yue opened up their doors to them and fed them on their way to the capital, Panyu. However, when they were just 16 kilometers from Panyu, the army of Nanyue ambushed and annihilated them and killed Han Xianxiu. In response, Wu Di sent another expedition to conquer Nanyue in 112. Though we aren't given too much detail on how it proceeded, it is notable for the fact that its 100,000 troops were transported by ship, some travelling to Panyu by river and some by sea. At the time, it may well have been the largest naval operation in Chinese history. Naval operations were not uncommon, though up until the Han Dynasty they had been mostly fluvial. The numerous important rivers like the Yellow River and the Yangtze had always been strategically important and had hosted battles and other military operations in the warring states in an era and earlier. By this point in history, the Chinese were building multi-level ships. According to historian Peter Lorge, they had also developed a method of carval building, where the planks that make up the hull of the ship are fastened edge to edge, like a caravel, rather than overlapping, like what you'd see in a clinker-built Viking longboat. Carval building allows for larger hulls and heavier ships. The centerpiece of the Chinese navy in the Han Dynasty was something called a tower ship. These were like floating siege towers, and were designed for launching projectiles over the walls of cities that were on a coast or next to a river. In this campaign, though, the ships merely acted as transport. When the army arrived at Panyu, two of the Han commanders set up their camps on opposite sides of the city. Liu Bode was to the northwest, and Yang Pu to the southeast. Liu Jia and his followers, knowing that they could not defeat the Han forces, secretly escaped the city in the night. Liu Bode was content to try a more diplomatic approach to victory. He granted marquisates to men of the Nanyue, who left the city, and surrendered to his camp, then sent them back to see if they could convince their friends to surrender too. However, Yang Pu was of a more violent temperament. He attacked the city and set it on fire, which caused more of the Nanyue to flee to Liu Bode's camp. By the next morning, Nanyue was utterly defeated. Liu Bode learned where Liu Jia had fled to from one of the surrendered Nanyue, and succeeded in capturing him. After the campaign, nine new commanderies were created in what had been the Kingdom of Nanyue, including two on Hainan Island, a large island in the South China Sea. Territories were also won from neighbouring tribes, whose chiefs could see that it was only a matter of time before conflict arose, and so chose to surrender to China. Another southern kingdom to fall to Wu Di was Dongyue, which was northeast of Nanyue. In 111, after the conquest of Nanyue, the king of Dongyue decided to revolt against China and invaded some nearby counties. He had good reason to be afraid of the Han, because Dongyue was in Wu Di's bad books. Dongyue was a splinter state of Minyue, and both were technically vassals of the Han. Dongyue had split off in 135 BC, after Minyue had nearly attacked Nanyue despite them both being vassals of the Han. Nanyue had asked China for help, and the Han had mobilised an army that were ready to intervene when the brother of the king of Minyue assassinated the monarch in an effort to prevent a Han invasion. This stopped the Han armies invading, and they put the grandson of the first king of Minyue, who had been appointed by Gaozu, on the throne. However, the brother who had led the coup wielded a lot of power, and started calling himself a king too. Because this brother, Zhou Yufan, had done a great service for the Han in, an, in assassinating the king. Wu Di didn't want to punish him, and instead set him up at the head of a new kingdom, Dongyue. 
Even before this, Minyue had been in trouble with China. In 138, it had attacked its neighbour, Dong Or, which was a Chinese vassal state. Dong Or appealed to China for help. At this point, Wu Di was still early into his reign and didn't want to cause a fuss by calling out the Imperial Army. The Supreme Commander, Tian Fen, wanted him to leave the matter alone. He considered the area around Minyue to be remote and inaccessible, and something that China shouldn't really bother itself with. However, a palace councillor, Zhang Zhuangzhu, made the moral argument in favour of intervention. He said, quote, A small country has come to report its distress to the Son of Heaven. If he does not save it, to whom can it turn for aid? And how can the Son of Heaven claim that the rulers of all other states are like sons to him if he ignores their pleas? Wudi approved, but was still hesitant to send the Imperial Army. Instead, he sent Zhuang to take command of the local forces of the bordering commandery Kui Ji and use them to save Dong Or. When Minyue heard that the Chinese troops were on the way, they withdrew. However, the king of Dong Or felt that his people were unsafe where they were, and asked the emperor if they could immigrate to China. Permission was granted, and thus the kingdom of Dong Or came to an end, and the people settled around the Yangtze and Huai rivers. So, Dong Or and its sister parent state Minyue had an unseemly behavioural record in Wu Di's eyes. Tensions were further strained when Han launched its expedition against Nanyue. The king of Dong'o, Zhou Yufan, had offered to send some troops to help the Han against Nanyue, and the Han had accepted the offer. But because of bad weather, Zhou was delayed in embarking his troops and sailing them to Nanyue, and in the end, his army failed to turn up. Perhaps unfairly, this put him in a very bad light in the eyes of Han, and Yang Pu, one of those generals who had been sent against Nanyue, even sent a letter to the emperor asking if, now that they had defeated Nanyue, he could go and conquer Dongyue on his way back. However, the emperor did not give Yang permission to do so, out of concern for that the troops were too tired to be sent on a second campaign. Nevertheless, Zhou Yufan learned that the Han generals were itching to invade his kingdom, and this provoked his revolt in 111. The Chinese responded with a multi-pronged attack, including transporting an army by boat to land on the coastline. Dong Yue put up some initial resistance, and managed to hold the Chinese armies by defending mountain passes. However, the jig was up when some of the Dong Yue elites, together with the neighbouring king of Minyue, killed Zhou Yufan. It was for the same reason that Zhou Yufan had first killed his brother. They were hoping that their actions would appease the Han, and save their kingdoms. Their efforts did not go unrewarded. Wu Di granted marquisates to those involved in the assassination, including the king of Minyue. However, he had had enough of the infighting of these southeastern kingdoms, and decided to get rid of them once and for all. As Sima Qian recounts in the records, quote, With the rebellion at an end, the emperor announced, The region of eastern Yue, Dong Yue, is narrow and full of mountain defiles, and the people of Minyue are fickle and have shifted their loyalties numerous times. He therefore commanded all the army officials to lead away the inhabitants of the region and resettle them in the area between the Yangtze and Huai rivers, leaving eastern Yue a deserted land. Because of the difficulties presented by the particularly mountainous terrain and jungle climate of the region, China did not attempt to establish commanderies in Minyue. Now, the same difficulties that prevented the Chinese setting up commanderies also prevented them from completely deporting the population of the region, as the records claims happened. Later down the line, new chieftains and tribes emerged from the people who were left behind. So, the real end state of Wudi's relationship with the Minyue region was that the Han recognised states there were destroyed, and that China left the region alone, as Tian Fen had advised at the beginning of Wudi's reign. In fact, the Han remained largely uninvolved with the region for the remainder of the dynasty, aside from small coastal colonies which were created as stopovers for ships travelling between the northern and southern parts of the empire. Just as a little side note, one of the interesting things about the aftermath of the conquest of the Yue kingdoms is that we get a few mentions of Yue culture actually planting some roots in Chang'an itself. A man named Yong Ji, who seems to have been from Dong'o, came to Chang'an after the conquests. In 109, he managed to get the attention of Wu Di, and told Wu Di a bit about the religious practices of the Yue. Yong said that in the past, the rulers of the Yue had been devoted to the spirits of the dead, and had thus enjoyed longevity and power, but in recent times, the leaders had been half-hearted in their religious practices, and that's why the kingdoms had become weak. As we'll see next episode, Wu Di was very interested in methods to increase his lifespan. 
and after hearing Yongzhi's tale, he established Yue religious sites in Chang'an. Sima Qian describes them, quote, The emperor then ordered the shamans of Yue to set up a place for Yue's sacrifices in the capital. It had a terrace but no altar. Here sacrifices were also offered to the spirits of heaven, the lord on high, and the various spirits of the dead, and a type of divination using chicken bones was employed, which the emperor put great faith in. Yongzhi offered some further cultural insight in 104, when the Boliang Terrace burned down. The Boliang Terrace was a tower in Shanglin Park, just outside the capital. It had been built in 115, inspired by the tower ships of the Chinese navy. At that time, before Ang Wo Xiaoji was sent to Nanyue, practice naval operations were conducted on the Kunming Lake in Shangling Park, just in case an invasion of Nanyue became necessary. Rudy had been so impressed by the tower ships that he constructed the Boliang Terrace in imitation of them. After it burned down, Yong Zhi informed Rudy that it was the custom of the Yue people, when a building was destroyed by fire, to rebuild it grander than before, as a way to overcome evil powers. Wudi thus built the Jianjiang Palace in Shanglin Park, one of the most impressive palaces of Chinese history. We'll talk a bit more about the palace itself next episode. For now, I just thought it a bit interesting to see that Wudi was apparently quite receptive to cultural input from Yue. Another region that came under Chinese control was the southwest. At the beginning of Wudi's reign, China's southwestern boundaries were marked by the commanderies of Xuanba in the Sichuan area. Beyond these commanderies lived many small tribes of people, some of whom were settled and some who were nomadic. There had been previous points in history where the region had come under Chinese influence. During the Warring States period, the state of Chu had made inroads into the area, and in fact in the time of Han there still existed in the region a polity called Dan, whose rulers were descendants of the Chu general who had conquered the region. Under Qin, commanderies had been drawn up in the region, and a road was built. However, the area was lost during the collapse of Qin, and since that time the Han had had little official contact with it. There was, however, unofficial trade between the tribes of the southwest and Chinese merchants from the southwestern commanderies. The people of the southwest were especially interested in Chinese silks, while the Chinese merchants brought back horses, long-haired oxen, and slaves. Official Han involvement in the region was initiated by the efforts of a man named Tang Meng, who was a county magistrate. On one occasion, in 135, he was sent to Nanyue on a diplomatic mission, and while there he happened to try something called dewberry sauce. He asked where it was made, and was told that Nanyue bought it from people living to its northwest, up the Zangye River. These were, of course, the tribe southwest of China. Tang did some more investigating when he returned to China, going to Shu and asking local merchants about the dewberry sauce. From these sources, he found out that the Kingdom of Nanyue was making a concerted effort to trade with the southwestern tribes, in particular the tribe of Yelang, in order to extend its influence. This was considered quite inappropriate behaviour for a state that was meant to be a vassal of the Han, and when Tang Meng brought the matter to Wu Di, the Emperor decided that China would make its own inroads into the region to snatch it away from Nanyue. For a moment, I'd just like to go on a tangent. Unfortunately, we are not given much information about how Nanyue's dealings with the southwestern tribes might have affected China's relationship with Nanyue. At the time, the king of Nanyue was Zhao Hu, the grandfather of Zhao Xing, the young king who was on the throne when the whole struggle between the pro-Chinese Queen Dowager and the anti-Chinese Liu Jia were going on. One thing that's really interesting is that in the records, in the chapter on the southwestern barbarians, Tang Meng is said to have reported to Wu Di that the king of Nanyue, quote, rides about in a yellow canopied carriage with plumes on the left side, like the son of heaven. This is an accusation that was usually laid at kings, both foreign and Chinese, who were putting on airs that they were equals to the emperor. However, from the account in the chapter on Nanyue, there's no indication that Zhao Hu was trying to challenge the emperor. In fact, it portrays him as quite a loyal vassal. In 135, when Minyue attacked Nanyue, Xiao Hu refused to raise his arms to defend his kingdom, until he had received permission from the emperor. The Chinese kingdoms were forbidden from calling out their armies without imperial approval. When the situation was resolved by the assassination of the king of Minyue by his brother, Zhao was very thankful for Wu Di for the Chinese armies that had been sent to counterattack Minyue. He said, quote, Death could not repay the debt of gratitude which I owe him. He intended to go to Chang'an himself to personally thank Wu Di, but his ministers persuaded him not to go, 
as they were afraid the absence of the king so soon after the affair with Minua would cause unrest, and were also worried that Zhao Hu would fall under Wu Di's influence and end up risking Nan Yue's independence, although he might even be falling into some sort of trap if he went to Chang'an. They warned him, quote, The former king, Zhao Tuo, the founder of Nan Yue, whom we've met in previous episodes, used to say that in serving the Son of Heaven, all that was necessary was to avoid a breach of etiquette. The important thing is not to be taken in by friendly words to the point where you commit yourself to a journey to the capital. If you ever go to the capital to visit the Son of Heaven, you will never return again. It will mean the downfall of the kingdom. Anyway, it seems that Zhao was not at all the sort of king who would challenge the emperor by imitating imperial customs. And aside from Tang Meng's accusation, there's no mention of him doing so in the records. I think it's unlikely that he imitated the imperial trappings accidentally, or did so without realising it would cause offence. After all, the previous king, Zhao Tuo, had for a time copied Han Court ritual as a deliberate method to proclaim his kingdom's independence from China. I'm not an expert, so don't take my word, but there are two things I can think of that might explain the discrepancy between the two chapters. The first would be that Tang Meng was either lying, or was relying on false information when he said that the king of Nanyue was going about in a yellow canopied carriage. The second would be that Sima Qian made some error in dating the events, or just wasn't precise enough in his account, and that the king Tang Meng referred to was actually Zhao Hu's son, Zhao Ying Chiu. Though the chapter on Nanyue does not say that Ying Chiu imitated the rituals of the emperor, it does appear that he was less respectful toward Wu Di than his father was. He was apparently a hedonist who murdered people for fun, and he declined several invitations to go to Chang'an, as he was afraid he would be punished for his behaviour. He may have been the sort of person who wouldn't have any qualms about insulting the emperor. Anyway, those are just my musings, and the inconsistency still stands. Back to the southwest. So, Weedy decided to make contact with these southwestern barbarians. He put Tang Meng in charge of a semi-military diplomatic expedition, with a party composed of a thousand soldiers and ten thousand porters, Tang ventured forth from Ba and met the ruler of Ye Lang, Duo Tong. Perhaps surprisingly, Duo Tong was quite willing to accept Chinese sovereignty over his lands, on the condition that his son would be appointed as their governor. In 135, the commandery Jian Wei was established, and garrison troops from Xuan Ba were set to work building a road to the new province. Now there's a fantastic paragraph in the records, which is a great little exhibit of Sinocentricism. According to Sima, Duo Tong and the other leaders of the southwestern nations had very little knowledge of China, and because of this, the envoys had to explain to them the might and virtue of the Han Empire. This is what Seema says when he's describing a later meeting between Chinese envoys and the ruler of Dian. In the course of his talks with the Han envoys, the king of Dian asked, Which is larger, my domain, or that of the Han ruler? And the Marquis of Ye Lang, that's Duo Tong, asked the same question. Because there were no roads between their lands and China, each considered himself the supreme ruler of a vast territory and had no idea of the breadth and greatness of the Han Empire. I just really love this assumption that any foreign ruler would be inevitably humbled when he discovered how great China was. And while there was probably some truth to this idea, in the case of Duo Tong, he also had more practical reasons for being so agreeable to Chinese encroachment on his territory. Chinese silks were highly prized by the people of the southwest, and it would be handy to have greater to have greater access to them. And of course, there's also the possibility that cultural and linguistic barriers prevented him from fully understanding the extent to which the establishment of a commandery entailed a loss of sovereignty for himself and his dynasty. Mind you, the Han took a pretty intelligent approach to the establishment of Jian Wei and future commanderies in the southwest. While they put the beginnings of the Chinese administrative apparatus into place, they also recognised local leaders and granted them noble titles so they would not feel like they were being sidelined. Duo Tong is called in the records the Marquis of Ye Lang, and though it's not clear whether he used that title himself before his encounter with the Han, or whether it was a title bestowed upon him by Wu Di, the fact that it is used in the records suggests that China recognised him as a noble in some sense. The fact that it was used in the records suggests that China recognised him as a noble in some sense. While relations may have got off to a smooth start, they soon became bumpy. While the Chinese were working on the road to the new commandery, there were several rebellions of the Yelang people, and soldiers had to be called to put them down. 
In addition, the project was undercut by logistical failures and the humid climate of the region, which resulted in many of the workers dying from starvation and disease. This was around the time that the Han were trying to conquer the Ordos from the Xiongnu, and Wudi felt that he couldn't waste the resources and effort on a sideshow in the southwest at this crucial point in the war with China's greatest enemy. So for the time being, work on the road was called off, and the commander was basically left alone to fend for itself. Interest in the region was rekindled in 122, when Zhang Qian returned from his expedition to the western regions. His report of seeing Chinese goods in Darcia, which had gone there from India, meant that there must be a way to get to the western regions by going south of the Himalayas, through the southwest. A secret expedition was sent to try and find such a passage. However, when they went through the lands of Dian, they were detained. The ruler of Dian, Chang Xiang, asked them questions about the Han, and sent some of his own men to see if they could find a way. But these men were also prevented from going further by the peoples of Kunming, and after more than a year passed, the Chinese envoys were released and made their way back to China. They reported to Wu Di that Dian was a large state, and that the Han should seek closer ties with it. The major expedition to the southwest occurred as a byproduct of the war with Nanyue in 112 to 111. For that war, Wu Di wanted to mobilize soldiers from the tribes living in Jianwei, the commandery that had been established in the lands of the Yelang. However, the men of these tribes, who probably did not yet think of themselves as subjects of the emperor, did not take kindly to the idea of being sent to fight a war between China and some other country. They started a revolt and managed to kill the governor of Jianwei. In response, Wu Di diverted some troops, released criminals, who were marching to Nanyue from Xuan Ba, and sent them to Jianwei to put down the rebellion. The Chinese armies killed the chiefs of those tribes that had rebelled, and went on a bit of a murder spree, attacking other tribes outside of the commandery that had just sort of been a bother to the Chinese over the years in their attempts to expand to southwest. It was a brutal show of force that terrified the peoples of the southwest. The other leaders acknowledged the emperor as their overlord, and the Chinese set up five new commanderies. The Marquis of Ye Lang had originally sided with Nanyue when the conflict broke out, though it's unclear to what extent this support entailed, whether it was just a political declaration or if it meant actively participating in the rebellion with other tribes. However, when Nanyue was defeated, the Marquis ruthlessly executed the ministers who had advised him to revolt, and because of this he was forgiven by the Han, and even rewarded with the title King of Ye Lang. Despite the grand title though, there was no actual kingdom of Yelang. The territory continued to be administered by the Jianwei commandery. Around this time, the Han tried to ride the wave of their impressive conquest of Nanyue and the other various tribes, and to send an envoy to Dian to try and persuade the king to become a subject of the emperor. However, Dian was a fairly strong regional power, and it would take a bit more to convince them. In 109, the Chinese sent a small army to conquer some tribes who bordered Dian, whose rulers belonged to the same clan as Dian's royal family. The army's success finally pushed Dian to accept Chinese authority. In textbook implementation of the Chinese governor local noble approach, the ruler of Dian was granted the title King of Dian, while the territory was formed into a new commandery, Yuzhou. Now I should talk a bit more about the nature of all these new commanderies created in the south and southwest. At this point in the Han Dynasty, Aside from the metropole region around Chang'an and the internal kingdoms, the commandery was the standard unit of administration all over China. But the level of government penetration in any given commandery could vary widely, depending on where it was and the circumstances of its creation. As historian Michael Lowe explains, quote, There were large areas of the Qin and Han empires over which the writ of the imperial government did not run fully for there were simply not enough officials to allow provincial or local government to be pervasive. In some regions, for example those of the valley of the Yellow River, administration was comparatively advanced and intensive, for it was backed by a long tradition of government in the pre-imperial age. The land was productive and the population accustomed to being organised. Elsewhere, for example in the northwest or southwest, provincial units were much larger, extending over a scattered and sparse population. Here the official posts were somewhat isolated, possibly surrounded by peoples who were not assimilated to the Chinese way of life. Officials posted to such areas were engaged in extending the scope of their activities, the collection of revenue, the conscription of manpower, and the maintenance of law and order as widely as they could. 
The new commanderies in the south and southwest definitely tended towards the latter type, large territory and light government. Historian Mark Edward Lewis describes them as, quote, little more than military garrisons, and Seema Chen says that they were, quote, governed in accordance with the customs of the old inhabitants and were not required to pay taxes. Unlike the new commanderies that were established in the conquered Xiongnu territory, there was no attempt on Wu Di to colonise these areas with Chinese people. The northerners had long had a distaste and fear of the human climate of the south, which was home to diseases that particularly affected those from temperate zones. The Chinese style of farming was also harder to apply to the mountainous, swampy, densely wooded lands of the south than to the lands of the north, which were just a bit colder and drier than what the Chinese were used to. There was also no real need for mass colonisation of the south. In the north, increasing the population of the frontier commanderies was a good method of strengthening them against powerful external peoples. In the south, the biggest threat to the new commanderies was the non-Chinese populations inside them, and while colonisation, if it had been feasible, might have been an effective way to quash this threat, the Han also imagined that it could eventually win the loyalty of its new subjects by its virtue and cultural splendour. The main Chinese interest in the region was trade in exotic goods, which did not necessitate a large population of Chinese people in the south. So even though it might look very impressive on a map when you see all the new southern commanderies after the conquest of Nanyue and its surrounding conflicts, on the ground level, these administrative structures probably felt a lot less manifest. One region that did see a bit more extensive Chinese involvement was the northern part of the Korean Peninsula. Even prior to Wu Di's reign, the Chinese were more familiar with the Korean Peninsula than with the lands to its west and south. According to legends, Chinese had had contact with Koreans from the start of the Zhou dynasty. The first historical evidence of a relationship is from the Warring States era, the state of Yan, in China's northeast, had a strong trade connection with Korean peoples, and Chinese coins from the era have been found there. After Qin's conquest of Yan and during the Qin dynasty, Chinese refugees are said to have fled to Korea. Later, during the reign of Gaozu, when the king of Yan revolted in 195, a man of Yan named Wei Man fled to Korea, where he apparently became a leader of the Chinese refugees as well as Korean tribes, and formed the kingdom of Chaoxian, which had its capital at Wangxian, near modern-day Pyongyang. During the first phase of the Han Dynasty, the Chinese were not in a position to really enforce their will on Chaoxian. During the reign of Hui Di, Wei Man and the governor of the Liaodong Commandery, which bordered Chaoxian, held some negotiations, and Wei agreed to consider himself a foreign vassal of the emperor. It was a good deal for him. All he was expected to do was fight barbarians who might try and attack China from the northeast, and to allow tribal leaders who lived beyond his kingdom, further down the peninsula, to pass through his lands and visit the emperor if they so desired. In return, he had a fairly strong guarantee that he would be left alone to slowly expand his kingdom. The Han recognised the Bay River, today called the Yalu, the river which marks the western half of the border between China and North Korea, as the boundary of Liaodong, and left the lands beyond Chaoxian. Wei Man's son and grandson, when they in their turns came to the throne, earned the ire of the Han a bit. Despite nominally being foreign vassals, they made no effort to keep in touch with Chang'an, and they were accused of harbouring Chinese criminals and preventing tribes in Korea from sending letters to the emperor. However, China had not yet switched to an outward-looking mindset, and there was not yet any attempt to bring the kings of Chaoxian into line. During Wu Di's reign, in the course of the war with the Xiongnu, China made a brief expansion which touched onto the peninsula. Following several Xiongnu attacks in 128, on the northeastern commanderies, and China's subsequent success in driving them back, a tribe of people called the Wei Mo, living in the north of Korea, submitted to the emperor, and a commandery named Tsang Hai was established in their lands. However, after two years, the commandery was disbanded, and we are not told what became of the Wei Mo. A more substantial effort was made in 109, and this one was directly targeted at Chaoxian. The Han sent an envoy to Wei Yochu, the grandson of Wei Man and reigning king of Chaoxian, with the object of scolding Wei Yochu for the perceived infringements that I mentioned before, harbouring criminals and preventing communication. The envoy, Shei He, was unable to persuade Wei Yochu to be a little more obedient, and eventually Shei left the capital of Chaoxian, Wangxian, and made his way back to China. On the way, he was escorted by someone called Zhang, who was the assistant king of Chaoxian. In a kind of bizarre move, when the two reached the edge of Chaoxian's territory, 
and Zhang was about to return to the capital, Xie He murdered Zhang and quickly escaped to the Han territory. He hoped that his action would be rewarded with Wu Di, and, strangely enough, when he told the emperor he had murdered a general of Chao Xian, he was indeed praised. He was rewarded with a military position in the commandery Liaodong, that province which bordered Chao Xian. Of course, Wei Yor Chu felt utterly betrayed by the incident, and he soon raised his armies and attacked Liaodong and managed to kill Xie He. In response, Wu Di started mobilising a force of mostly criminals and prepared to attack Xiao Xian. The whole thing makes me wonder if Wu Di's promotion of Xie He was actually a sneaky move to provoke Wei Yor Chu into attacking. The Chinese forces were divided into two armies. One was led by Yang Pu, who had just recently participated in the war against Nanyue. His army was 50,000 strong and travelled to Chao Xian by ship, crossing the Gulf of Bohai, another impressive naval feat. The other was led by Sun Ji. He marched overland to Korea with an army of unspecified number. The whole campaign against Chao Xian was characterised by bungles and miscoordination on the Chinese part, yet in the end the hand proved successful. Before the armies were completely ready, a subordinate commander of Sun Xi's dashed ahead with his division from Liaodong and was dealt a sound defeat by Chao Xian. His men routed back to China and he himself was executed for his mistake. The defeat delayed Sun Xi's whole army, which meant that Yang Pu, travelling over the sea, arrived at Wang Xian first, with a force of 7,000 men. It's unclear what was going on with the rest of his original 50,000. Perhaps some had been lost during the ocean crossing, and maybe others were still on their way. Wei Yor Chu could see that Yang Pu's army was only small, so he led his army out of Wang Xian, and attacked, and again succeeded in routing the Chinese. Yang Pu's men fled to the mountains to the north and east, and it took him 10 days to gather up the survivors and reorganise his army. Meanwhile, Sun Shi was attacking a Chao Xian army at the Bay River, but it was unable to break through into Chao Xian. Wu Di saw that his armies were having a little difficulty, and decided he needed a new approach. In a move that was really quite bold and funny when you think about it, he sent an envoy named Wei Shan to threaten Wei Yor Chu with further attacks if he did not surrender. Here he was, sending a message to an enemy that had just routed two of his armies, and he had the confidence to negotiate as if he were in a position of strength. Wei Yor Chu thought up a little trick and feigned an apology. He said that he had been worried the Han generals would betray him if he surrendered to them, but now that he had the word of an official envoy, he was ready to lay down his arms. He offered to send his son, the crown prince, to Chang'an to act as a hostage. Thus, with 10,000 Chaoxian soldiers in tow as an escort, Wei Shan and the crown prince set off for China. Just like that, a Chaoxian army was about to march freely into Han territory. However, when they got to the Bay River, where Sun Zhi was encamped, Sun and Wei Shan consulted, and said to the prince that his soldiers must leave their weapons behind before crossing. This agitated the prince, who began to fear for his life. Before Sun and Wei could stop him, he simply turned around and took his men back to Wang Xian. Poor old Wei Shan was left empty-handed with nothing but failure to report to Wu Di, and when he got back to Chang'an, he was executed. Back on the front, Sun Zhi launched another attack on the Chao Xian forces over the Bay River, and this time he was successful and marched on to Wang Xian. At the same time, Yang Pu had regrouped his army and headed back to the capital. Like what had happened to the Nanyue capital, Pan Yu, Wang Xian found itself with two separate Chinese armies camped outside it. Sun Shi and his forces were at its northwest, while Yang Pu and his were on its south. In the siege of Pan Yu, Yang Pu had been the general who was most eager to attack the city. However, this time, he was the one who tried to negotiate a surrender. His men were demoralised from their sea crossing and their initial defeat, and he didn't feel like he could manage a direct assault on the city. On the other hand, Sun Shi and his army were riding off the high of their victory over the Chao Xian at Bay River, and their eyes were set on taking the city by force. Sun attempted an attack on the city by himself, but Wei Yor Chu refused to surrender. However, the attack did push the High Minister of Chao Xian to secretly send messengers to start talking with Yang Pu. Sun then tried to rope Yang into making a joint attack on the city, but now that Yang was negotiating with the High Minister, he declined to attack when Sun asked him to. He was hoping that he could get the city to surrender on his terms, and thereby achieve the sort of recognition that he had failed to win in the campaign against Nanyue. In frustration, Sun started sending his own messengers to the city. 
but the Chaosian favoured Yang's messengers, which created even more tension in the general's relationship. Sun began to suspect that Yang was being too friendly with the Chaosian, and even worried that Yang might change sides and attack his army. Meanwhile, Wu Di was getting frustrated with the lack of progress, and he sent another of his own envoys to Chao Xian, this time granting him authority over the two generals. The envoy was named Gong Sun Sui, and he was determined to get the campaign in order and force the surrender of Chao Xian. Luckily for Sun Ji, Gong Sun arrived at his army first. Sun told Gong Sun his fears over Yang's loyalty, and in response, Gong Sun promptly summoned Yang Pu and arrested him. He merged Yang's army with Sun's, giving Sun total command over the forces besieging Yim Wang Xian. Outrageously, though, when Gong Sun sent a report of what he had done back to the Emperor, Wu Di replied with orders that Gong Sun be executed. It seems really bizarre to me, and it's not explained why in the records. I guess Wu Di thought that depriving Yang of his command was going too far, or something. So, Gong Sun was executed, even though what he had done ended up being the move that finally convinced Chao Xian to surrender. So, with the whole army under his command, Sun Ji renewed his attacks on the city. The increasing pressure inspired some ministers and generals of Chao Xian to flee the city and join the Chinese. Still, Wang Yuo Chu wouldn't cave. Finally, though, in the summer of 108, a Chao Xian minister named Tsen was fed up enough with the king to assassinate him and announce the city's surrender. Before the Chinese could move in, though, a former minister named Cheng Si took the podium and declared the city in revolt again. But Sun had some surrendered Chao Xian late with him now, a prince and the son of a minister, and he sent them to persuade the people of Wang Xian to rise up and execute Cheng Si. Thus, the kingdom of Chao Xian was finally conquered. The campaign against Chao Xian was a miserable experience for all those involved. Although it ultimately ended in victory for the Chinese, Wu Di was deeply unhappy with how his generals had behaved. Both Sun Ji and Yang Pu were sentenced to death when they returned to China. The charges against Sun Ji included, quote, inordinate striving for distinction, jealousy of his associates, and betrayal of strategy. Yang was tried for attacking Wang Xian too soon after arriving in Chao Xian, rather than waiting for Sun and his men to arrive. Yang was able to commute his sentence by paying a fine, and he was demoted to the status of a commoner. Sun wasn't so fortunate. He was executed with his corpse displayed in the marketplace. Sima Chen concludes his chapter on Chao Xian, with a paragraph summing up the unfortunate fates of the various people involved with the campaign, and it's quite a curt, terse read. Quote, The Grand Historian remarks, Wei Yor Chu trusted in the natural barriers protecting his land, but brought an end to the sacrifices of the state. Shei He achieved distinction through treachery, and became the cause of bloodshed. Yang Pu, leading a meagre army, met with hardship and blame, Regretting his failure to win in distinction in the siege of Pan Yu some years before, he sought for it this time, but instead aroused suspicion. Sun Ji contended for glory, but he and Gong Sun Sui suffered execution. Both armies disgraced themselves, and none of their leaders were enfeoffed as marquises. Although the leaders of the campaign didn't accrue any personal benefit, the Han Empire was able to expand. Four new commanderies were created on the Korean Peninsula, Again, like the new commanderies in the south, these probably started off being quite lightly governed, and in fact two of them, Zhen Ban and Lin Tun, were dismissed in 82 BC, a few years after the end of Wu Di's reign. However, the two that remained, Xuan Tu and, L- and Luo Lang, were able to develop a style and depth of government that was very similar to what could be found in the commanderies in the Chinese core lands. As historian Yu Ying Shi explains, these commanderies faced neither powerful external enemies, like those of the northwest, nor were the native populations within them organised into strong tribal hierarchies, as was the case in the southwest. This meant that the commanderies didn't need to be very militaristic, as the ones in the northwest were, and at the same time the ability of the native population to resist the penetration of a civil government was minimal. Thus, Yu says, quote, it was apparently appropriate to set up units of government of precisely the same type as the regular provincial organs of the empire, in the expectation that the officials of commandery and county could administer their areas with the same degree of efficiency. We're just about ready to wrap up this episode on Wudi's foreign ventures, but there's one more thing that I ought to mention, which was the creation of the Office of Colonel Protector. Following the victory of the so- over the Xiongnu in the Grand Campaign of 119, 
a few Xiongnu subject tribes who lived in modern day Inner Mongolia were able to gain a modicum of independence from the Confederacy and form closer ties with the Han. Two of these tribes were recognised by the Chinese and were called the Wu Huan and the Xian Bei. It's possible that before the conquest of Maodun, these two tribes had had their own nomad confederacy, which the Chinese called Dong Hu, meaning Eastern Barbarians. However, Maodun had defeated them, and until now they had been Xiongnu subjects. Following the campaign of 119, one of these tribes, the Wu Huan, surrendered to their Han, and were settled in the five northeastern commanderies beyond the Great Wall. The office of Colonel Protector of the Wu Huan was created to supervise them. The officer's headquarters were near modern-day Beijing. The main task of the Colonel Protector was to prevent the Wu Huan from maintaining ties with the Xiongnu. Perhaps contradictorily, though, the Chinese also used the Wu Huan to observe Xiongnu movements. Tribal chieftains of the Wu Huan were expected to pay tribute to the Emperor once a year, but aside from that, the Colonel Protector was meant to just provide some light supervision and not intervene in the Wu Huan's internal affairs too much. Another Colonel Protectorate was established in 111, over the Chang. Remember those tribes living in China's west that Li Guang had once fought with? Over the years, some of the Chang tribes had migrated into China. The first recorded instance happened during the reign of Jingdi, when the emperor granted permission to the Yan tribe to settle in the Long Sea Commandery. Historian Yu Ying Shi proposes three reasons why the Chinese might have been willing to let Chang tribes immigrate. Firstly, moving Chang tribes into China would be an effective way of separating them from the Xiongnu, whom the Chang tended to ally with when the later attacked China. Secondly, the Chang were noted by the Chinese as having a high birth rate, and there may have been an idea that letting some of them move into China was better than letting their population reach critical mass on the border. Finally, because some of the Chang tribes were agricultural, the Chinese might have expected that they could be easily assimilated to Han culture. Now, the process of migration was not without its violent moments, such as the revolt that Li Guang had to suppress. This Colonel Protectorate was established to try and smooth relations with the Chiang tribes living in China. There was a military element to the pacification strategy, establishing agricultural garrisons which could act as a first line of defence in case of a rebellion, but there was also an effort to win the goodwill of the Chiang. The office had a complement of translators, and it was tasked with listening to the complaints and grievances of the Chiang tribes. What's important is that the establishment of these offices, as well as the creation of dependent states which I briefly mentioned when we talked about settling the surrendered Xiongnu in, in the Ordos, marks the first serious steps to attempt to integrate non-Chinese peoples into the empire. The theme of barbarians in China would become a very important one during the reigns of later Han emperors. Let's finish off with some numbers. At the start of Wudi's reign, China had 41 commanderies, including the capital region. At the end, it had 83. Most of the new commanderies were the result of expansion. By my count, there were 23 individual campaigns launched in Wudi's reign, 19 of which were directed against the Xiongnu, or the western regions. According to historian Junshu Zhang, 3.9 to 4.4 million square kilometres of territory were acquired. The borders reached in Wudi's reign roughly set China's shape till the present day. Zhang puts the total number of men sent against the Xiongnu and to the west at 1.2 million cavalrymen, 800,000 infantry, and 10.5 million men in support and logistical roles. The infantry and cavalry alone form a number that is larger than the total armed forces of any individual belligerent nation during the Napoleonic Wars, except for France. Such campaigns and gains, all achieved in the rule of one emperor, are simply astonishing. At the height of military activity, the 120s BC, Zhang estimates the total annual cost of the standing army at 21.4 billion cash on the low end and 40.1 billion at the high end. Total annual revenue is estimated at 20 billion cash, so these figures represent 107 to 200% of the government's income. And this is just the cost of the standing army. It costs more than three times his usual upkeep to send an infantryman out on campaign, and nearly twice the usual upkeep for a cavalryman. This is why that backlog of wealth that had been built up by previous emperors was necessary for Wudi's campaigns. Spending at this extraordinary rate was completely unsustainable. So in regards to the frontier, Wudi's legacy was one of great triumph, but also great cost. How he was remembered for this, and what it meant for the empire going forward, is something we'll talk about in future episodes. <laughs>
Well, that's that for this episode. Thanks for listening. I've had a few people emailing me with feedback uh, and some questions, so I'm very appreciative of that. If you've been enjoying it, um, I'd love to see some reviews or or some emails. You can contact me at uh, ospin-history at tutornoter.com or you can use the message box on my website offspinhistory.wordpress.com As always, I'm not a historian, I don't speak Chinese, and uh, I'm just doing this for fun. So, yeah. As always, I'd like to thank Professor Shui Shan Yu of Northeastern University, who, who played the music, which I use. And Merry Christmas, everyone.